first of all, welcome everybody for coming. Um, so uh, this is the fourth edition of Orson, uh, the online recommender systems and user modeling workshop. Um, we have a very interesting program uh, for you. So we'll start with a keynote by Olivia Jonen. Uh, a very interesting one, I, 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 I bet. <laughs> uh, then a short break, and then we'll divide the, the session in uh, three smaller sessions, uh, all including an invited talk and a contributed paper, the presentation of a contributed paper. Okay. Um, uh, so this is the program. I'm not going to read it out, of course, but uh, uh, the program is available online uh, on our website. And uh, uh, the, the, the actual papers of the contributed, uh, uh, contributed papers are available for download uh, also on the website. Um, uh, I would like to give a huge thank you for these people that helped uh, uh, going through the contributions, uh, and, and basically this is it for me. So if you want more information, you can check uh, the website. Okay. Uh, you can also follow the, the, the Twitter account, although we will not be uh, posting a lot during the workshop. Um, and, and that's it. And I'll, Pass on. I'll pass on to to, to Olivier. Olivier is a, is a, is a, is an outstanding was an outstanding PhD student because he defended a few a few days ago. Uh, you 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 of course know him from the from the if you didn't know him before you know him from from the, the conference that just um, happened in Amsterdam. He won a best best paper. Um, so. Uh, without further ado, I ju I'll just pass it uh, pass it on to you, okay? Uh, and uh, the floor, uh, not the floor, the screen is yours, Olivier. <laughs> Thank you for a very nice introduction. Um, okay, I, I think that you can see my, my slides now. Um, you can? Yes. Okay, great. All right. Um, so, yeah, um, a huge thank you as well for the invitation. Um, I am really very glad and very honored to be able to speak to you all today. Um, and so the title of my talk is going to be um, the quest for recommendations with online success. Um, and so the main goal for me is to basically give you a, a tour of the research that I've been doing for the last four years. Um, and it's largely going to follow my path um, on, on basically trying to figure out what it is that I wanted to do and what I, I felt was missing. Um, in order to actually achieve a system that is able of, of, of doing great things in the world uh, by, by giving people the right set of, of um, basically uh, the, uh, like the right set of recommendations. Um, so first of all, uh, I will start with a small introduction. Um, then we'll go over things like online similarity computation, um, moving on to something like online regression. Um, then we'll go more towards systems that are, are sort of trying to optimize metrics online uh, and, and maybe also think about um, the sort of impact of showing recommendations to users in the, in the real world. Uh, so first, a small introduction. Um, I, I think that most of these slides are probably not really necessary for the workshop at the Recommender Systems Conference, um, but still it's, it's nice to be, 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 um, be as certain that we're all sort of really talking about the same things here. Um, so what you have in practice uh, is, is many web scale businesses and platforms have very, very huge, um, um, uh, basically a very, very huge item catalogs. Um, when a user is going to come to the system, uh, they will only be interested in, in maybe a small handful of them. And so the goal of the systems that we are trying to build is actually to figure out what these items are for each user um, and then show them to the users so we can actually hope to, to sort of uh, make them um, more engaged with, with relevant content. I would say that that's the, the main goal in a, um, in a nutshell. Um, and how we have been doing this for a long while now 
um, is by learning from what users are actually doing on the platform. Um, so we have a certain user, this, this user might view, for example, a, a sequence of, of, um, of different pages on a retail website. Um, and then we sort of pick out a certain item um, and we try to predict what this is. And when the system is great at predicting what this item was that the user saw in this session, um, then we assume that it's actually a great recommender um, and we have a nice paper and that's it and we move on. Um, I would say that that's the very, very simplified uh, workflow that we have been using for the last uh, basically two decades. Um, and then we have seen many, many uh, businesses that are actually using these systems now on a daily basis. Sorry, I, I heard someone speak. I'm not sure. Okay, no, sorry. Let me move on. Um, and so uh, these uh, systems have basically spawned um, many, many widespread applications, um, and they are being used by by many of the, the largest businesses um, in the world, actually, actually these days. Um, but I would say that what they are basically trying to achieve and how the systems that we are building have to perform basically on these platforms is slightly different from doing a simple train test splits and computing something like hit rate and then moving on to the next paper. Um, and one main reason there um, is that these models have to be periodically updated over time. Um, new data is going to come in. You need to, to battle things like your concept drifts and, and, and make sure that your model is actually basically fully up to date. Um, but as you get more and more data, most of the time, it's also going to become more and more uh, sort of costly to actually keep your model up to date. Um, and when the runtime becomes longer and longer and longer, uh, the model that you will have basically in production is always going to be slightly delayed. Um, and this is going to be an issue. Um, basically on one hand, because you want a model that is, that is very recent, but at the same time, it's also just very, very sort of costly to do these computations the, the entire time. Um, so this is why I would say people have been resorting to uh, things like online learning um, to actually keep these runtimes minimal and, and be able that um, let, uh, and be able to ensure that we actually have a system uh, that is, is is really doing well in production um, at a certain minimal minimal cost. Um, and so again, I'm certain this is a very uh, redundant slide, uh, but what you see here is a user item matrix um, where you have a certain user. Um, um, this blue guy over here, uh, this guy has bought a certain orange guitar. And so there's a one on that row and that certain column in the user item matrix. Um, and we are going to assume that it's binary now um, and that it, it's, it's uh, basically consisting uh, of some form of implicit feedback. Uh, these can be views, these can be clicks, these can be sales. Um, it doesn't really matter for now, but it's just, we, we have this, this certain matrix. Um, and the model class that I will focus on uh, are, are full rank models um, because I really like them actually. Um, the, the main thing that people have been using in the past are, are sort of matrix factorization models. Um, but what we see there is actually that most of the time these models become better and better and better if you keep increasing the number of latent factors. Uh, so it's a low rank model, but we're trying to make them as full rank as possible because then we actually have much more information. Um, and there has been some work uh, in the past years showing that these full rank models really are, are very, very um, basically are competitive with, with matrix factorization models. And so what you have here is you have a certain user item matrix, um, but we're going to multiply it with a certain model that we're going to learn, which is the matrix S. And then we're going to get a certain approximation of the original matrix. Um, and this is going to hold our, our scores that we now computed. Um, and so the model is really just going to be a certain number for every pair of items i and j. Um, and if that number is high, then this means that the item i has a high sort of impact on the recommendation score j. So when you have seen the item i, uh, there's a good chance that you might see the item j as well in the future. Um, and then the first part of this talk, as I said, is going to be about online similarity computation. Um, and the reason that I said that is because one of the most well-known approaches actually um, is to use something called an item-based k-nearest neighbors. Um, and what you're actually doing then is within this framework, you're saying that in this matrix S at the index ij, we're just going to compute the, uh, 
the, the cosine similarity between the vector i and the vector j um, as a, a certain column in the matrix X. And so this works actually rather, rather well. Um, but because this matrix X can be huge, it's not always that easy to actually have a, a fast way of computing the cosine similarity between these vectors. Um, and so this was the first paper that I actually uh, published at Rexis ever. Um, we found a way to do this. Um, and the reasoning is, is actually rather simple, I would say. Um, when you think about a, a binary user item matrix and you look really closely at what you're actually trying to compute with the cosine similarity between a certain item i and a certain item j, um, it actually boils down to the number of users that have seen both items divided by the square root of the number of users that have seen the first item and the square root of the number of users that have seen the second item. Um, and so basically what we need to have in order to have a fully up-to-date mechanism for computing the cosine similarity is we need the, um, the co-counts basically for two items and we need the counts for an item. Um, so we don't really need to have a matrix that has the exact cosine similarity and basically trying to keep this up to date when new data comes in, but we can just have a matrix with the co-counts and we can have a vector with the accounts uh, and this is going to be enough to compute the exact cosine similarity um, when these two are actually fully up to date. Um, and then basically um, it turns out that it's not that hard to really keep this up to date. Um, we can, for example, just uh, start building a certain index on the fly. So many approaches that have been doing this in the past will always build a certain index beforehand from the data and then use this index to do some sort of fast similarity computation. Um, but it turns out that you can start doing this similarity computation while you are building the index. And so this is why we call it dynamic index. Um, and so we start off with a fully um, sort of empty index where for every user, we just have a certain inverted index that has nothing in there yet. We start looping over our data. Uh, and when we see a certain view for the user U and the item I, what we do is we look at the other items that have been viewed by this user U. Um, and for each of these items, we are going to do a small sort of plus one in our co-count matrix. Uh, then we're going to count the fact that we actually saw this item. And then we are going to push the item in the inverted index for that user. Um, and so these are three steps that are, are very, very easy to do, uh, very, very fast in modern systems. Uh, and when you do this, you actually sort of end up with, um, for a, a certain point in time, when you have passed over your entire data once, you actually have enough to compute the exact cosine similarity between all pairs of items. So that's great. Um, it also seems to work quite well. Um, so here I am not going to go into many details because it's not really too important, um, but you can see that for multiple data sets, you have the runtime on the y-axis, you have um, the fact that we are um, sort of increasing the, the, the size of the data sets over the x-axis, and you can see that we are faster than, than the baselines. So this is great. Um, it also turns out that this actually works much, much better if the co-counts are sparse. Um, it's much more efficient if users have very short histories. And the reason for that is because we are sort of looping over this inverted index. If it's a very short inverted index, it's just going to be much faster. Um, and we can use this system to, to sort of process um, in the order of tens of thousands of user item interactions um, per second. And that's on a single core even. Um, so we also have ways to actually um, do this um, in a more uh, parallelized manner um, for which there are some sort of details in the paper. Um, but it also seems to work really, really well. So if you increase the number of cores, you're actually able to, to vastly increase the throughput as well. Um, and so we can see that basically for all four data sets, uh, the runtime really, really sort of goes down uh, using a number of cores, which is still relatively modest, I must say, if you compare it to fancy approaches using GPUs and, and, and all of that. Um, so it works really well. Um, a speed of factor of, of more than four just on, on, on very simple hardware. Um, there are some, some issues with doing this sort of parallel, uh, um, with doing this sort of parallelization and these are um, sort of fully, um, these are fully, these are fully, fully incremental updates, um, but still overall it, it works quite well. Um, so here we might actually think, well, okay, we have a, a very efficient system. Uh, 
it's a very well-known technique, like it's been used for years, we can do this fully online, maybe we're done, right? I mean, maybe this is just exactly um, the only thing we need to have online success. Um, but maybe it's also not enough, right? Because it's working, it's fine, uh, but it is a technique that was proposed in 2001. Uh, maybe we can actually do, do better. Um, and so this is where we move on to online regression. Um, because even though using a simple ISMKNN is, is fine, um, there's actually still a rather simple technique um, that actually works way, way better. Uh, and so this is the um, model, um, it's called Ease, um, and it was proposed by Harold Steck in 2019. Um, and it's actually a very smart extension of the SLIM model uh, that was proposed in 2011. Um, and so here we, we still have this sort of framework where we're learning a certain sort of item by item matrix. Uh, but instead of, of filling this, this matrix with the yeah, cosine similarity between these column vectors, what we're going to do is we're going to minimize a certain least squares problem, uh, which I would say is the simplest of problems to actually um, solve. Um, in the original SLIM paper, you have um, a sort of constraint that you need the matrix to be sparse and you need the matrix to be non-zero. Um, but it actually turns out we don't need that. And it's really just um, minimizing the, the squared loss between the reconstructed matrix um, and this, this um, 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 the squared loss between the reconstructed matrix and the original matrix uh, with a certain like sort of L2 regularizer on the model. Um, and we have to make sure that the diagonal of this item-based matrix is zero, um, because if it's one, then we just refer to the identity matrix, which is a, a very um, a, um, a very trivial solution to the problem, uh, but not that, that useful. And so the main reason why this work um, has actually has sort of spawned much attention um, is because it is entirely computable in, in closed form. Um, and it's actually a, a really nice property to have. Um, so the first step is, is to compute the Gramian matrix, what's it called? Um, and so this Gramian matrix is, is just a fancy term for saying the co counts between certain items. So it's computed by, by doing a certain matrix product by the transpose of the user item matrix with the user item matrix itself. Um, but in essence, we're just basically trying to compute the co counts. And this is just a small part of the first paper that I was talking about, right? Uh, we can do this very efficiently. We can do this in parallel. We can do this on streaming data, and it all works really, really well. So that's great. Um, then the second step of the model is to invert this Gramian matrix. Um, but this is a problem, um, because this is actually an operation um, that has cubic time complexity. Um, well, it's not really cubic, but it's more than quadratic. Um, so that really, really doesn't scale well. So when we have very large sort of item catalogs, this no longer is a feasible thing to do. Um, for small item catalogs, it's doable. But even then, when you have to do this again and again and again, because you have to keep your model fully up to date online, uh, this is not really a feasible thing. And we, we really want some way to keep this matrix inverse fully up to date uh, without always having to recompute it from scratch. Um, so I basically thought about this. Um, I googled, is there a way to do a matrix inverse um, without having to recompute it uh, entirely from scratch? And it turns out there is. Um, and so then you find something called the Woodbury matrix identity, um, which seems like a very daunting formula, I'm sure. Um, but it's actually pretty simple. Um, so what you're seeing on, on the left-hand side is, is a certain matrix A plus a certain matrix decomposition, UCV. You want to take the inverse of that. And what you're doing is this formula on the right-hand side. But what's nice is that the formula on the right-hand side, it's only using the, the, um, the uh, matrix inverse of the original matrix A. And here, there is a second inverse, but it's a matrix uh, of dimension C. So if C is much, much smaller than A, this is actually going to be much, much more efficient than recomputing the entire thing. Um, and if you then link this to what we're actually using, we want to compute the matrix inverse of the Gramian at a certain time t plus one. Um, we can write this as the original Gramian at a certain previous time point and all of the updates that we've done to the Gramian in the past few hours, maybe. And then we need to find a matrix decomposition for this G delta, because then this G delta is actually this UCV in this matrix. Um, and then we can, we can actually plug that into the formula and, and we're done. 
And it turns out that this is actually a pretty simple thing to decompose. Um, because it's a very sparse matrix, um, it's a symmetric matrix because it's the co-counts. Um, and there are many, many things you can use. Um, we decided just to stick with um, a simple eigen decomposition because it's fully exact and it's actually pretty fast. Um, but it turns out that there's, there's many, many things you can do. Uh, they are all basically just in sci-fi. Um, and, and you have many sort of randomized methods that are not going to give you the exact solution anymore, but they're really, really fast. And you can do these updates just in the order of, of seconds. Uh, and once you have this, you have your, your U, C, and V matrix for your updates. You plug this into this fancy formula and you're done. Uh, and so this really works the fastest um, when the update to the Gramian is low rank, um, because that's the reason you have this U, C, V. If you see it as a sort of singular value decomposition, um, the, the rank of the matrix is going to be, um, the, the, the rank of the original matrix is going to be the dimensionality of the matrix in the middle. And that's the one that you have to um, do an inverse of in the matrix identity. Um, so it's all just really, really nice. And this is actually, seems to work pretty uh, well. And so the rank of this, um, um, the rank of this update to the Gramian is actually also something that is really often going to be low rank. Um, so that's, that's all really great. Um, so we can look at some experiments so we can see that when you have, um, for example, um, on the most recent movie lens data set, uh, you look at the time in this data set over the sort of X axis, you loop over it in a sliding window and, and you have certain model and you're doing these um, exact model updates uh, using this, 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 this new method, it all seems to work really, really well. Um, you can see that we increase the, the size of the window. So if you're doing a certain update uh, for every six hours of data, it's, it's very, very fast. Um, but if you're doing your updates in, in, on, on longer and longer windows of data, it's becoming slower and slower to actually do this. Uh, where um, for a certain point, when you do your update on three days of data per batch, it actually becomes slower than, than, than doing the original computation at some point. Um, but still, uh, it's all great. If you do your updates really often and, 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 and um, 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 when the, the uh, time between two updates is only six hours, it really takes a few seconds and you're basically done. Um, and we see that, that so the, the rank of the update really is the deciding factor between the runtime. Because we can see here that um, there's a very nice correlation between higher ranks and higher runtime. So if we're able to actually keep those ranks low uh, for the updates, then we know that the runtime of the update is not going to be too much. And then there are certain ways to actually bound this. Um, so, I mean, I know that I'm going through this quite fast, but it's also because the details are really not that important. Um, but it turns out that there are simple ways to actually bound this rank as well. You can see here for the movie lens data sets, um, you can bound this rank by, by looking at the number of users in your update batch. Um, and then there are basically a few different data sets for which it's not the number of users, but it's the number of items. Okay, sure, sounds good. So now we have a way of, of actually doing fast dynamic updates to a recently proposed model, which is still on many data sets getting the state of the art results. Um, so maybe we're done now, right? Maybe now we have reached sort of online success. But no, uh, sadly not, I would say. Um, and the reason is, is something that I'll, I'll sort of talk about over the next few minutes. Um, when we go back to, to what we looked at as our goal, um, we looked at learning from purely implicit feedback. Uh, so you have a certain, a certain sequence of items that have been, been watched by a certain user. Um, we hold out some items, and if we are good at predicting those items, then we've done a great job and we're done. Um, but we've at the same time seen that um, the offline evaluation results that we typically get for this setup really don't have a high correlation with the sort of online success metrics that we actually really care about. Uh, and so maybe there's a big problem there. Because um, when we just look at a problem frame like this, we're, we're basically saying that a good recommendation is one that the user found already without us showing a certain recommendation in the data set. So there's some sort of sense that a good recommendation is some sort of optimal, in some sense, a sort of um, 
in some sense, I mean, in some sense, a sort of autocomplete of user behavior. Um, and this is very different from, from actually learning a system that is, is performing certain real world, I mean, showing recommendations to people in the hopes of having some sort of effect on them and, and, and being able to show people things that maybe they wouldn't have found uh, without the system. Um, so maybe it's, it's not really that surprising that if we, if we frame our task in this original way, uh, that the results that we get don't really match with our sort of metrics online that we care about. Um, and this is an issue, um, but this is something that we've seen really time and again in, in recent years. So maybe um, if the goal is to, to learn what a good thing to show is, maybe we should actually look at data uh, stemming from logs of recommendations. Um, and so here we then sort of move towards a learning from, from bandit feedback framework, uh, where you now have a certain agent. Uh, this agent can show sort of recommendations to a user. Um, and then the agent can observe whether there's a reward or not for a certain action that it has taken. And the goal of the agent is, is going to be to learn which actions it should actually be taking in order to obtain a positive reward. Then you have the agent. The agent is going to have some sort of interactions with a batch of users. And then after, let's say, something like t time steps, is, there is going to be a certain model update. The system is then going to show new things to users. There's going to be a model update. And you have this sort of cycle uh, where the system is, is sort of constantly going to try to improve itself over time. There are basically two classes of, of models um, to actually do this. Um, I would say the, the, okay, so I missed the slide. I'm sorry about that. <laughs> um, but the data that we need for this uh, is then just what was shown at which time and was it successful or not. Um, and if you write this down in, in fancy Greek letters, you get um, this certain context feature X. Um, you have an action identifier A, which is what was shown. You have the logging propensity, uh, which you need for, for some methods, but also not for some others. Uh, and you observe the word C. And so this, this, this logging propensity is really because you need to have logs from a system that was um, stochastic. Um, if your system is basically always showing the same things to the same people, um, there's no way to actually learn from that data because there, there's many, many things that you can never learn there. But as long as, as the system is randomized in some way, when you have enough data, you can actually learn, learn many things from it. And there are two classes of, of methods um, to actually do this. Um, the first one is, is the, the value-based class, uh, where you, you try to learn a model for the probability of a click um, given a certain context action pair. Uh, and then when a user comes to the system, you just show the item that has the highest probability of leading to a click. Um, you also have more fancy methods um, that are based on policy learning where you don't really care anymore about the probability of reward, but you just want to be able to take actions that lead to a reward. Um, and so then you sort of move into the realm of using counterfactual estimators and inverse propensity scoring and all of these things. Um, but um, recent advances, um, I would say, are, are, are um, I mean, these certainly aren't solved problems, but in recent years, we've seen that there are many, many approaches that actually achieve very, very strong performance in these settings. Uh, and there are some, some, some sort of new insights. So, so when you're doing something fully on policy, if you're really learning from your own data and you're learning very quickly, um, we know that you should actually be explicitly sort of optimistic because when you are sort of overestimating the probability of a click for a certain context action pair, um, when you can learn very quickly, this is actually not a problem because you are then taking this action, but you're learning that it was an overestimate and that's fine and you're moving on and you're sort of improving the system. Um, so in these settings, it's actually, it's provably um, the sort of optimal thing to do to work with a certain upper confidence bound. Um, some recent other work has shown um, that when you're in a more sort of off policy setting where you're not able to learn from your mistakes, uh, you should actually be explicitly pessimistic. Um, there have been many ways to sort of combine um, the, the, the strengths of doing policy learning with sort of value learning um, and many, many, many more. Um, so I would say that this really isn't a solved problem, but there are many, many approaches that actually can, can do this pretty, pretty well. Um, and we can then try and frame this into our sort of item-based 
uh, system that we have. So now we still have the user item matrix X. We're still going to try to learn model S, but now the outcome is not going to be to try to reconstruct the user item matrix. But now the outcome is going to be a certain matrix that is, is basically going to show um, the estimated outcome of recommending a certain item I to a certain user U. So it's no longer going to be whether we think that the user saw this in the training data, but whether we think that the user would click when we show this as a recommendation. And the advantage of framing this um, in a rich regression formulation is that we can just reuse all of the work that has been done on Ezer um, and, 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 uh, and these models that are very similar to that. Um, but what's nice as well is that when we talk about the, these sort of fancy methods with uh, things like UCB or things like LCB, where, where we are, are basically trying to use the variance of our estimator to, to figure out whether we should be um, leaning towards optimism or leaning towards pessimism, um, this variance is actually also computed by um, computing the gramian between the user item matrix uh, and then taking a certain inverse of this. Um, but I spent a few slides away, some time explaining that this is actually something you can rather easily keep fully up to date with streaming data. And so we have a way to have the mean of the posterior, which is just the sort of easier model, um, but, but, but using the, this new formulation and this new data. Um, we have a way to get the, the variance of the posterior, which is just by having the same matrix inverse. Um, and we can really just use the existing methods that we had for um, our dynamic easier methods um, in a banded world as well. So maybe we're done now. Um, we have very fancy algorithms that are able to really focus on the optimization of certain online metrics. Uh, we have methods to actually keep them fully up to date in a very online way. Maybe this is great. Um, but we're not there yet. Um, because I would say that we often have, have a certain budget um, where this all works well if we can just keep the models running the entire time. Um, but you have to have some way of, of, of ensuring that with a fixed budget, you're doing the best you can. Um, and what happens typically is that I would say every certain amount of hours or, or every certain amount of events, um, people do a model update. But maybe that's not the best thing to do, right? Because it might be that there's just a few hours where the data that we got was not that interesting. It wasn't really changing the model. And maybe during certain peak moments when the data is really drifting, we're not doing enough updates. So maybe we should find a certain way to schedule our model updates based on when we are detecting this sort of concept drift. Uh, and then with, with a fixed budget, with the same budget as the method that is just doing an update every sort of six hours, for example, um, we can now do these updates at the right time. And for a fixed budget, maybe we can see an increase. Um, and so this is some, some very recent work um, that I won't be able to go into detail um, on. Um, but we, uh, we, uh, we saw some, some really nice improvements actually recently um, by, by doing this. So with, with the rather simple setups, um, you see that that a, a fixed budget can really give you uh, a rather significant improvement if you schedule your model updates at the right time. Um, and this is work that was done by Robin Verrechte um, at, at Frumo, um, who is also here at the University of Antwerp. Okay, so now, now surely we're done. Uh, we were actually already quite happy uh, and we can do even more without increasing the cost. So, so this should be online success. Um, sadly, I, I don't think so. Um, because maybe we should also look at what, what happens after we show a recommendation to, to someone. Because we observe clicks, um, but a click is, is not everything, right? Um, we can maybe say that a click is, is factorized as relevance and exposure. So when a certain item is relevant to a user um, and the item is exposed to a user, then we see a click. But if the item is exposed and not relevant, we won't see a click. And if the item was relevant but not exposed, we also won't see a click. Um, and this can be an issue. So when we look at an example where maybe we have the perfect model, um, we really have a model that, that is going to tell us the probability that the user will find a certain item relevant, um, as shown here. 
Um, and this is not a certain estimate. This is really just, this is exactly it. And what we then decide to do is, well, okay, when a user comes to the system, we rank our items based on this true probability of relevance, um, and we're done. Because this is, I mean, this sounds like a, a very sensible thing to do. But if you didn't see what happens, um, is that when you adopt a certain user model where, where there's a, a certain decaying probability of, the, of a, um, a certain decaying probability of an item being exposed at a certain rank, um, we can see that the expected number of clicks actually goes down pretty quickly um, throughout this list. And so we can now see that maybe the item um, that is here at rank 15, it has a probability of being found relevant of 0 0.85, um, which is a rather marginal difference with the item at rank one, which is 0 0.90. But if you look at the expected difference in the number of clicks is that the item at rank one is going to get more than twice as many clicks as the item at rank, at rank 15. Um, so this might be an issue because if we're a music streaming service, for example, um, we're, we're sort of ensuring that there's much more exposure and much more clicks to the first, um, um, the, sorry, uh, the musical artist for the first item, uh, they might get much more revenue, they might get much more streams, much more income, that's great for them. But we might be driving the artist at sort of rank 15 away from the platform. Uh, and so maybe, I mean, um, this is not only not a moral thing to do, it also might just not be in the best interest of the system itself, because this might not be viable for this artist to actually keep on making music. And we might not be having a sort of healthy ecosystem now. Um, and that's a problem for music recommendation as a simple example. But if you think of job recommendation, uh, where I mean, very, very small differences in, in relevance might have a very large sort of impact on these people's lives. Uh, so that's also an, an important thing to actually model, I would say. Um, and there are many people who have worked on, on similar things in, 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 um, in the last years. Uh, you have the principle of sort of equity of attention that when you're showing recommendations, each and every item should be getting uh, the same amount of attention. Um, this has been sort of extended uh, into various settings where, where you want fairness of exposure in sort of every type of ranked list, uh, not only um, um, when the system is a recommender system. Um, this has been extended again into the sort of equity of exposure system. Um, and then also a recent paper that we had where you extend this to the, the abandoned setting um, and, and many, many more. Um, and so maybe when we think about having something like online success, Maybe we shouldn't purely focusing on, on, on getting a very high sort of click-through rate. Um, and, and, and maybe the notion of having something like online success um, should be a bit, a bit broader than that. Because even when we have an exact model that, that is going to give us the true probability of relevance, um, just using it blindly is probably also not, not the way to go. Um, so to conclude, um, I wanna say that something like online success has no single definition. Um, but there are some things that are important and that we, we, we should sort of keep in mind when we devise new algorithms. We need models that can thrive in these sort of highly dynamic environments. And it's great to have models that, that are able to do very fast updates when new data arrives. We can have models that directly optimize sort of online metrics, which I think is also really a very important part of, of, of getting somewhere um, where we ha have some sort of notion of online success. Um, and then finally, it should be important that we know that the models that we're using don't just make predictions, but they're often making something that's more of a, um, that, that's more of a decision uh, when you actually start showing recommendations to users and, and you have a certain impact on, on many things. Uh, and this is also something that we should be aware of uh, once these things go, go fully online. And then I think there's many things next. Um, this is just, a, a, a small sample of the work um, that I have been doing in the past few years. I have tried to include some work by different people as well, uh, but it's a vast, vast research space. And this is, so, uh, um, this is a, certainly not um, the, the entire picture. Um, and then I just want to thank uh, the people uh, who have been sort of working with me uh, on these papers that I have been trying to present uh, for the past 40 minutes. Uh, it's Bart Hutals, Jan van Balen, Robin Vrecht, uh, and Koen Verstrepen, and, and, and many more. Um, then all that's left is, is for me to really thank you for listening to me on a Saturday afternoon, um, and I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you.
Hey, thank you so much, Olivier, for your nice presentation. So, uh, if anyone would like to ask questions, they, 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 they have, everybody has permission to open the camera and, and, and the sound, so you can just do that, okay? Any questions? I, I can I can ask a question while uh, other people are thinking. <laughs> um, it's it's um, it's related to data. So it, it's very nice to have this uh, this this approach of optimizing online metrics. However, you, in order to do that, you need access to online systems with real users, right? And, yeah. and this comes with two problems, I guess. The, I, I'll just put put them forward, and you, and you can comment the, the way you you you, you prefer. Um, the first problem is that I, my impression is that most uh, people in industry are maybe um, a bit afraid to test uh, new things on 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 their user on their users uh, without no without having guarantees that uh, that uh, nothing will be messed up and the other dimension is that uh, this is very nice for for people in the industry to to be able to do that if they want however if you don't work in the industry it will be very hard to do research uh, using this kind of approach so what because yeah. you, you really don't have access to that data exactly so exactly. what what would you say about that what what would be your comment about that yeah um yeah so so the first part being being that it's it's uh, it's hard for um yeah it's hard for certain companies to move towards something like a banded based method when when you have no sort of guarantees that that's going to work better um I would say sure, uh, but that's also the case for for going from a, a very simple item KNN to using deep learning and 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 all of that. Um, but I would say that that certainly in, in in recent years we have seen some very very cool advances um, being reported from from people actually leveraging their their sort of banded feedback. Uh, that doesn't mean you need to drop your entire stack and move towards using purely something like reinforcement learning. Um, but I have been very, very impressed with the numbers that are sometimes reported in papers by Google from, from just using bandit feedback on YouTube instead of, of, of just um, data from, from, from people viewing certain items. Because people have only a very short amount of time and YouTube is, is massive. So just having data from, from a person viewing like a... a a certain series of items, uh, it doesn't give you a full picture of what they like and what they don't like. And when you actually show things, when you have banded feedback, you can probe what they like and what they don't like. And so, you, I mean, it's also a way of, of getting a much more broader set of information about the user, um, I would say. Uh, so there will never be any big sort of guarantees, um, but I, I would certainly say it's, it's worth having a look at. Um, and then secondly, when we're, yeah, I mean, there is a problem uh, of researchers in academia not having any access to these online platforms. And then it becomes pretty hard to actually test these systems. Um, and so that's why most of the work that I've been doing in this space has been purely focused on using simulators. Um, I think there certainly is a case to be made for simulators. Um, and they, they certainly bring some value to the table. Um, but of course, I would prefer to actually have a system um, to actually use and actually be able to, to, to show things to users. Um, now, I, I think it, it might not be very realistic of me to assume that there will be a, a system that will be entirely made available to researchers for live experiments in the following years. Um, so I, I think that we'll be stuck with simulators for a while now. Um, so I think that it's important to maybe make sure that that these that there's a certain common design framework for using simulators 
because now it does seem like most people are just uh, basically building a simulator that fits their needs. Um, but that doesn't really make things very sort of reproducible. Uh, there aren't many papers that are actually using the same simulation framework. Uh, and so there it becomes also harder and harder to actually gauge what is progress and, and, and what isn't. Um, so yeah, um, I would say more data would be great. Um, if there's anyone who, who knows someone with data or has lots of data and they would like to share it, I'm very open to it. Um, but I, I, yeah, I mean, I, I'm, um, it's also understandable that, that people don't really tend to share it that much. Uh, and I try not to have too high hopes for that. <laughs> okay, thank you, Olivia. So anybody else? Yeah. David? Hello? Yes. Yeah. Ah, okay. Yeah, uh, thank you, Oliver. Very good uh, talk. Uh, I have two questions. Um, one is perhaps a very stupid question. Uh, in your uh, matrix uh, factorization, uh, you have like uh, x uh, hat uh, across, approximate to x times another s. Uh, I noticed the dimension of S, X and S, those two matrix, and the, uh, they, they have a common dim uh, dimension is, is N. Uh, usually I remember in the matrix factorization, that number is, is a R, it's like some, some number smaller than N, so you can kind of uh, reduce the uh, complexity. Uh, is that uh, a kind of a, like, it, it, did I understand that correctly or? There is some special purpose you you use the uh, the the n, which is the original dimension. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So so um, we are not really doing matrix factorization, um, and it's a it's a full rank model. So oh, okay. um, you you basically have the user item matrix. You try to learn um, a model which is a certain item by item matrix, um, and then we have certain constraints on this matrix, being that uh, you need the diagonal to be zero. Um, because if you don't have that constraint, you're just going to learn something simple like the identity matrix. But when you do have that constraint, what you're actually doing is you're, you're forcing sort of each sort of entry in each row to be computed as a weighted sum of the other entries in that row. And so that basically uh, boils down to saying that um, when you try to estimate whether I, I, I don't know, uh, saw a certain movie, you are just going to take away that some of the other movies that I have seen um, in the past. Um, and then maybe for a certain movie uh, pair, uh, like if the weight is very high, it's going to have a very high sort of contribution to what you're trying to predict. Um, so I it's see. A, a slightly different model class then. Okay, so it's not it's not the matrix factorization. It's, it's, uh, no, no, okay. Exactly. Uh, the second question actually is a follow that. I remember uh, in your second slide, uh, incremental similarity computation, uh, you mentioned in the binary setting and you can have that simple calculation uh, regarding that the cosine similarity. Uh, and then you derived the uh, kind of uh, incremental um, uh, method. Is that also applied to non-binary setting or this is only uh, be valid to the binary setting? Um, the formulas that I showed were basically only valid for the binary setting. Um, but I remember um, that I talked about this in the future work section of that paper. Uh, but that now has been two years and I haven't really looked at it again. But I, uh, if I remember correctly, I, I think it's doable. But you need to um, do some like a few things extra um, because then um, now we have this inverted index from from a user to um, basically their their uh, sequence of items that they have seen in the past. Um, when it's no longer binary, you need a certain tuple saying, "Well, this user has this value in that matrix," um, instead of just assuming that it's one. Um, so. I mean, I am pretty sure that it's doable, but it's going to make things slightly more complicated um, to actually get it implemented. Uh, but I'm okay. certainly that it's that it's doable. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Um, yeah, I, I think that that's my question so far. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. Someone else? Stephen. Hi, Stephen. <laughs> 
Hey. Yeah. Um, so if there are no more questions, I guess uh, for now, I guess uh, um, I guess we're done for this for this for this first part of the workshop. Okay, Olivia, thank you again. Uh, I would give you a round of applause, but this is virtual, so we we just have to imagine the clapping. Um, uh, so we'll be back uh, at four. Uh, uh, PM uh, Amsterdam time. Uh, Four ten. I'm sorry. Uh, Four PM. Four ten PM. Um, and that's it. Thank you all. Hi everyone. Uh, welcome back. Um, we have uh, uh, now a new session with two presentations. Uh, we'll, we'll start with an invited talk by Cesare Bernardis. Cesare, uh, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Okay. Can you hear me? Welcome. Uh, so Cesare will present uh, his current work with Paolo Cremonesi, uh, entitled NFC, a deep and hybrid item-based model for uh, item called start recommendation. Cesare, go ahead, please. Thank you, Joao. Let me share my screen. OK, you should be able to see it, right? Right, yes, we see it. Perfect. So thank you, Joao, again. So hi, everyone. I'm Cesare Bernardis, PhD student at uh, Politecnico di Milano. And I'm here to present my work, uh, which is entitled uh, NFC, a deep and hybrid item-based model for item called star recommendation, which is a joint work with Professor Paolo Cremonesi. Uh, the work has been submitted and recently accepted for publication as journal paper at, as journal paper at UMUAI uh, on the spatial issue on dynamic recommender systems and user model. So, okay. so I will start with the presentation with an introduction on the well-known item called star recommendation problem. Then I will present the, uh, our new model called neural feature combiner. And I will discuss the results of the experiments performed in different scenarios uh, for both qualitative and quantitative analysis. And I will conclude my presentation with some final remarks. So uh, the main types of information exploited by common recommendation, common recommendation engines are mainly two, as you uh, probably know. The first is collaborative information that encloses user taste uh, under the form of user feedback, user ratings, or even implicit interactions uh, between users and items in the system. Collaborative information is particularly important because it is known to lead to high accuracy of, of recommendations in most scenarios. But unfortunately, this type of information is not always available. And one of the most common examples uh, is when new items that are also called cold start items are introduced into the catalogs, uh, which happens daily in modern online systems. Clearly, user feedback for, for these items is not available, uh, so the recommender has to rely on other forms of information, uh, like, for example, content information, which is probably the most common uh, type of information exploited in this scenario. So content information is mainly represented by the characteristics of the items that describe these items, and it is already available when new items are added to the catalog. Uh, there is a problem. Recommending cold start items is usually uh, a very important duty from one point of view, uh, but it is very hard because uh, we do not have user feedback about them. So, um, moreover, due to the high frequency and quantity with which new items have to be included in the recommendation lists, the model in charge of producing recommendations must be, hand must be able to handle them uh, in real time and at scale. Indeed, presenting the right content at the right time is uh, for sure crucial for the success of online applications. And in order to be able to recommend those items, these cold start items, modern techniques merge content and collaborative information in hybrid approaches in order to get you know, the, the best from the two words. Uh, among the most common techniques, we can, uh, for example, identify feature weighting models that assess the importance of content features using collaborative information and mapping models that simply map features to a hybrid and usually low dimensional embedded space. There is also a branch of recent works that propose feature weighting models that learn weights uh, of, uh, of the features using collaborative similarity matrices as target values. 
practi practically what they do is uh, they train the feature weighting model in order to ensure that the weighted similarity uh, content-based similarity they learn and the target collaborative similarity are as close as possible. And this work claimed that learning from collaborative similarity values has a number of advantages over learning from user item interactions directly. For example, the first uh, is that similarity matrices are usually denser than user rating matrices, and it is consequently easier to extract less noisy collaborative information. The second is that it is possible to choose the similarity matrix uh, the similarity model that generates the matrix uh, in order to uh, be able to select uh, how collaborative information is processed. And the third one is that uh, this type of models usually require uh, less time to reach convergence. So it has been shown in these works that feature weighting uh, is able to lead to competitive accuracy despite its simplicity, and it also has very fast training and different procedures. But Clearly, feature weighting models have limited expressive power, especially if compared to modern deep learning approaches or even mapping approaches. So our question was the following. Is it possible to find a more powerful technique with respect to feature weighting model that had a higher expressive power, but at the same time was able to preserve the scalability and the real-time applicability of a simple model like feature weighting, and that could also exploit the advantages, the claimed advantages of learning from collaborative similarity values. So uh, to this extent, we propose neural for collaborative, ne sorry, uh, neural feature combiner that we also called NFC, uh, which is a deep learning item-based similarity model that takes as input the content representation of an item and produces as output the similarity between all the warm items in the systems and, and the input item, where warm items, for warm items, of course, we intend the opposite of cold items. So the items for which we actually have collaborative information. Uh, Notice that NFC generates an item similarity matrix as output, while preferences for the users uh, are predicted like a common item based model. So just computing the dot product between the user profile and the similarity vector generated by the NFC model. Moreover, the this way the model can be trained using collaborative similarity values as target in order to take uh, advantage of the benefits we have mentioned before. So the architecture of NFC is composed by two main components. Uh, the first one is the embedding network. The second one is the combination network. The first one, which is the embedding network, uh, takes as input the content representation of an item and the produces as out output uh, a low dimensional hybrid embedding. And it, is it is composed by a simple fully connected neural network with non-linear activation function. The main goal of this architecture is to let the expressive power of deep learning uh, to capture nonlinear relations among multiple item content features in order to uh, represent also high level concepts that are not originally present in the data. The second part of the network is the combination network that takes the embeddings as input and combines the features that compose these embeddings in order to compute the similarity values. Uh, it is composed by one single and small fully connected neural network for each warm item in the system. So we are able uh, to give the capability to the model to combine the features that compose uh, this, the embedding in different and multiple ways, depending on the target item uh, that similarity refers to. The idea is that items with, with very different representations might have a high similarity score with the same warm item because uh, user might look at different characteristics of the items. So the peculiar architecture of NFC gives two very interesting properties to the model. The first one that we can see uh, in this slide is that new items can be easily introduced in recommendation lists. So for example, assume to have a new item and that it, it is added to the system. And as soon as the content representation of this item becomes available, NFC is able to generate the similarity values between all the warm items in the system that were already present before and the new item in one single inference step uh, without the need to retrain the model. Uh, then it is possible to append the new sim similarity vector to the uh, similarity matrix we already have with the, uh, all the warm items. And at this point, the model can predict the preference of the user for the new item together with all the previous items that were already available in the system. The second property is that 
NFC is able to decouple the content representations of the items, removing the overlap constraint over the content features uh, that affected many similarity, mo um, similarity models for cold star recommendations uh, uh, belonging to the state of the art. Again, as an example, consider two items that have no content features at all in common, and therefore they have, of course, a, similar, a content similarity which is equal to zero. If users in frequently interact with both of them, or in other words, the collaborative similarity between these two items is, has a high value, uh, it is hard for common hybrid models to combine collaborative and content information because they lead to very different conclusion. Uh, with NFC instead, two items can have a very high score, high similarity score, uh, even if they have no features in common at all, since only the content representation of the input item is taken into account, while the information, especially the collaborative information about the target item is already included in, in the trained model. So in our experiments, we wanted to assess mainly the validity and the effectiveness of NFC in top end recommendation. Uh, so we performed several offline experiments in different scenarios. The first is a common uh, item called star scenario. Well, we test NFC against a, seri a series of uh, baseline, but we also want to test whether uh, learning from similarity matrices is uh, actually a good idea also for NFC. The second scenario is a hybrid scenario where cold and warm items have to be recommended together. And the third scenario is an extremely cold scenario where uh, the collaborative information is reduced and up, up to almost zero. So uh, the experiments were performed on four data sets that also provided uh, high quality editorial uh, features for items. Uh, to assess the accuracy, we used two metrics, recall and DCG, uh, and two cutoffs at 10 and at 25. And to generate the target matrix used to train an FC, uh, we tested four different item-based models belonging to the state of the art. So as mentioned, the first, and I would say also the main experiments uh, what, um, were performed in a common item called star scenario. And in order to reproduce this type of scenario, uh, we performed a holdout split, taking the 20% of the items and all their interactions to uh, form the test set. Uh, the remaining 80% of the items and the interactions was instead used for the training of the models. We repeated the experiments 10 times, changing the random seed used to perform uh, the split in order to account also for uh, statistical variance in the results. And to optimize the performance of the different models, we tuned the, hyperparam the hyperparameters on an opposite uh, validation test, validation set uh, obtained with the same split, with the same uh, methodology uh, described, uh, but applied on the, on the training set. So as mentioned, the first question we want to answer is whether using collaborative similarity values as, tra as training targets instead of user ratings uh, is effective also for the training of neural feature combiner. So we propose three variants of NFC that learn from interactions directly, directly instead of similarities, and we compare them with the original implementation of NFC. So the architecture of these variants is identical to the original one. The only difference is in the computation of the loss. So indeed, um, uh, given a true user item preference, we let the model compute the prediction for this user item couple as a dot product between the user profile and the similarity generated by uh, NFC. Uh, and we compare then uh, the estimated preference with the true pre preference value computing the loss. We tested three different types of losses, uh, implying also three different uh, learning tasks, a regression task with mean square error, a classification task with binary cross entropy, and a learning to rank task with uh, Bayesian personalized ranking. So here are the results. And as you can see from the upper table, learning from similarity uh, leads to the highest accuracy in the item called star scenario by a large margin. From the lower table instead, you can see that learning from similarity uh, also allows reaching convergence in a fraction of the time required by the alternatives uh, that learn from user item interactions. Uh, as an additional note, I would say, we can see that among the different variants we proposed, uh, the regression task with MSC is, is usually uh, the, um, the one that provided the highest, the higher, the highest accuracy, uh, but it was also the slowest in the training. A second step, 
what we want to do is to compare, of course, NSC with the current state of the art for item cost star recommendation. So we selected a number of common baselines, both hybrid and content based. Uh, the results that we can see in this table show that NFC outperforms the state of the art by a large margin on all data sets and independently from the cutoff. And I would say also uh, the, uh, the metric, which I mean, I did not report, but you can also, uh, you will be able to see in the, in the paper. Uh, the improvements are quite evident uh, since they range between 10 and 20% over the second best performing recommendation algorithm. Moving on to the second uh, scenario, uh, the second scenario is the hybrid scenario. So with this scenario, we want to simulate a real system where new call the start items uh, are introduced aside warm items. And both these types have to be recommended together at the same time. So we perform a holdout split, retaining again the 20% of the interactions for the test set and using the remaining 80% for the training. But differently from the call scenario, the test interactions are selected so that a percentage gamma belongs to call start items so, uh, so that they are selected as presented before in the call start environment, while the remaining Y minus gamma percentage belongs to warm items. And it is selected randomly from their interactions belonging to the items that are available during the training of the models. These tests are performed with different uh, values of, uh, of gamma uh, that correspond, of course, to different balancings of uh, uh, warm and cold selections. So as you can see um, from this pop, these plots, we compared NFC with uh, the baseline presented before for the cold star scenario. And we also include SLIM as a representative of the best performing purely collaborative uh, approaches. Uh, as a note in the plots, NFC is represented by a continuous violet line. As expected, SLIM, uh, which is the collaborative approach, um, is very accurate in, in warm scenarios, but its accuracy drops as the portion of interactions related to cold items uh, becomes predominant. NFC on its own is, is able to outperform all the other cold start uh, uh, approaches uh, uh, by a large margin, also in this scenario, even though the difference becomes smaller at high percentages of cold items. This result uh, suggests that NFC is particularly effective in exploiting collaborative information, but of course, when it is available. The last scenario we want to test NFC in is the one we call the extreme cold star scenario. The holdout methodology adopted to split the training and the test uh, is the same used for the cold start scenario, but we incrementally increase the amount of cold start items included in the test set up to the 80% of all the items that were available in the data set. The goal of this, of this experiment is to simulate a scenario where there is an extreme scarcity of collaborative information. As a practical example, uh, we could mention the ramp up scenario where the system is still in its early stages. So the available user feedback is very poor and most of the items have no interactions at all. So uh, they can be considered cold items. So uh, the results in this scenario are particularly interesting, I would say. NFC is still represented as a continuous purple line. Uh, is the best performing algorithm up to the 60% of the items uh, present in the test, uh, where the collaborative information up to this, at this point becomes so scarce that the purely content-based algorithm uh, is able to outperform all the other hybrid approaches. Uh, moreover, notice that NFC is the technique that suffers the most up the, the, the absence of collaborative information as it is highlighted by the steeper slope of the line uh, in the plot. These results confirm what I mentioned before, which is that NFC is able to effectively exploit collaborative information, uh, but it is, these results also affirm that uh, this type of information, collaborative information is crucial to obtain the best performance out of the new NFC model. So beside the accuracy analysis, we also perform a second set of experiments where we also perform a qualitative analysis of the embeddings generated by NFC. Uh, the main goal of these experiments is to gain explainable insights uh, on what the model is actually learning. And to perform them, we, them, we use the, the Yahoo Movies dataset um, since it contains high quality editorial features. And we think that the movie domain is more common than others. So we expect the results will be more easily explainable. 
And the experiments we performed were of two types. The first is, was a neighborhood analysis, which studies the closest neighbors of an item in the embedding spaces uh, learned by the different models. Uh, the second is a feature important analysis that assesses what are the most important features considered by the NFC algorithm. So for the neighborhood analysis, we reproduce the cold star scenario um, used for the main experiments with the 80-20 split. Um, and we analyze the movies belonging to the James Bond saga because they cover a wide period of, of time and they have very different, very different, sorry, uh, casts, uh, very different crews. So they should present very different content representations. Uh, in the analysis, we ensure that only one movie of the saga is in the training set as a warm item, while all the other are in the test set as cold items. In this example, we show the five nearest neighbors of The World is Not Enough, which is one of the 14 movies of the saga that were present in the data set. And the neighbors are selected among the items in the test, uh, in the test set. So we expect to have, of course, the movies belonging to the saga among the closest neighbors. Indeed, what we can see is that NFC uh, is able to put only James Bond movies among the uh, closest neighbors uh, of the tested item. Interestingly, uh, also the purely content-based um, algorithm is able to do the same, uh, even though we could expect differently because as I mentioned before, uh, James Bond movies usually have very different content representations. The other hybrid approach we show here as an example uh, struggles instead to recognize James Bond movies, and the only uh, and it is able to recognize only two movies belonging to the saga. More results uh, can be found, of course, in uh, and further explanation can be found in the paper. As second experiment, which is a feature uh, importance analysis, uh, we compare an FC with two uh, feature weighting models um, belonging to the state of the art. So. Well, assessing the feature importance in a deep learning model is not a trivial task. So we adopted a well-known uh, approach called deep lift, uh, which is a method for the explanation of the model outcome. Uh, in the image, we show the 10 features with the highest importance according to the different models. And from the result, we can see that clearly the two feature weighting models on the left uh, focus their attention on, a, on one single uh, but very characterizing feature, like for example, bond or 007, uh, while all the others are almost irrelevant. Uh, note also that the presence of such characterizing features also explain why uh, we had such good performance in the, um, of the content-based algorithm in the, previous, uh, in, the, in the previous experiment. NFC instead is able to balance its attention uh, among the, um, across the different input content features, taking into account also relevant but generic and popular features, like for example, the genre. So to conclude my, my presentation, I would just uh, summarize saying that uh, NFC can be uh, affirmed as a powerful approach that effectively merges the advantages of learning from a collaborative similarity matrix uh, with the expressive power of deep learning to obtain accurate recommendations when cold start items are involved. Uh, indeed, the results show that NFC outperforms the state of the art by a large margin in three different scenarios, that, um, and it efficiently, it efficiently exploits collaborative information, uh, extracting, the, extracting it from uh, similarity values. Finally, we also shown that NFC is able to generate robust and easily explainable hybrid embeddings, taking into account not only specific features, but also uh, different aspects of the original counter representations of the items. So this concludes my presentation. I would like to thank you for your attention and thank also the organizer for having me for, uh, for this talk in this workshop. Thank you, Cesare. Uh, very nice presentation. A very comprehensive work. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, so I would like to ask uh, anyone in the audience uh, if they would like to make any questions. Seems not. I do have a question myself. Uh, so it's I, I'm risking uh, making a stupid question, but I'll do it anyway. Um, questions are never stupid. <laughs> so uh, what uh, what uh, what I would like to ask is um, essentially 
how important is it to use a, a deep learning framework as opposed to using a shallow model like matrix factorization or autoencoders or whatever, shallow autoencoders or whatever. Um, yeah, we think that the complexity that I, that is included in similarities, so similarities usually uh, are a single value that include lots of information in it because it expresses the similarity between two items. And we thought that maybe simple models like, for example, feature weighting or even matrix factorization uh, could not be able to uh, extract all the possible information in order to reproduce the correct similarity value. Indeed, we tried to, we, try, we tested some matrix factorization models for uh, the same target that we use NSC for, but the accuracy was not comparable. So uh, we did actually do an, an, a kind of ablation study, and we realized that in this case, deep learning is actually effective in learning the, uh, the relations between the items and in combining uh, content and collaborative information. Okay, great, thank you. Any other questions? Um, it seems not. Cesare, thank you very much. Uh, for thank you for having me. Uh, thank you for coming. <laughs> uh, so we move on to the next presentation. Uh, so the next presentation will be done by Benjamin Wang. Uh, it is a contributed paper to the workshop. Uh, uh, it is work with Sebastian Shelter and it, it is entitled Efficiently Maintaining Next Basket Recommendations Under Additions and Deletions of Baskets and Items. Okay, Benjamin, go ahead. Yeah, thank you, uh, Joa. Can you, can you hear me well? I've been having uh, internet issues today. So we, we, I can hear you perfectly. Nice, thanks. Gonna start sharing my screen in a second. Yeah, it should be also be able to see my slides. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, yeah. So, hi everyone, and uh, yeah, I'm Benjamin Wan. I'm uh, a machine learning engineer in uh, Adrian Amro Bank in Amsterdam, and uh, this is a joint work with uh, Sebastian Schilter and the University of Amsterdam. So, yeah, Sebastian is currently on holiday in Italy, so I'm, uh, I'm presenting here. Um, so the title is uh, Towards Amnesiac Recommender Systems, Efficiently Maintaining uh, Next Basket Recommendations Under Additions and Deletions of Basket Items. Let's start. So uh, agenda for today, first gonna give introduction or motivate our problem by uh, talking about the right to be forgotten and uh, the right to unrecommend. I will explain that later. And then uh, some background information about next basket recommendation and one of the state of the art in this area, uh, T4KN. And then we'll talk about our approach and how, how we adapt the incremental learning and also decremental approach uh, jointly. And then, then we talk about our, our implementation in Spark and uh, some evaluation results and finally uh, some conclusions. So uh, as you probably know, in Europe, there's GDPR. So basically requires the, the companies to, to the user data um, uh, upon request in a timely manner. And this applies not only to the original data and copies in relational uh, databases or data lakes, but also applies to the representation uh, uh, retained within uh, models. And some, some legal scholars even argue that the continued use of machine learning systems trained on deleted data can be considered illegal under interpretations. And, and in practice, the, the data deletion procedure uh, required by GDPR is quite a tedious uh, process. Uh, for Google and Facebook, it takes uh, from uh, two to six months to actually uh, uh, execute the deletion. So I, I recently, there is, uh, there is a new regulation coming up in China, uh, very recently. So quite a crowded uh, slide, but uh, in, in essence, it gives the user the, the right to uh, turn off recommendation services in a timely manner, and also give user the right to delete those uh, user modeling tags within the recommendation services. So, so with, with these uh, two uh, regulation uh, efforts, uh, uh, we think uh, as a community of industry and, uh, and from academia, we should, we, should, we should design algorithms and also systems to empower users to exercise the right to, to be forgotten or to unrecommend uh, as timely as possible. 
So we, uh, uh, we did this work in the context of uh, next task recommendation, which is a, a sequential recommendation task. So it is, yeah, in a, in a high level is a simple task. So uh, for a user with, uh, with a, a, a history of, of shopping baskets, say, in a chronological order, the task is basically to build a model to recommend uh, the next basket uh, uh, in a, yeah. Uh, so TPKM um, is one of the state of the art in this area. So here's just a brief introduction to see how it works. So given a user uh, with a chronological order of basket, a basket series, and each basket is, uh, is, is one hot encoded so with ones and items they, they had interaction with and the zeros other places. So, so the first step is to create a groups of basket uh, of equal size. So divide uh, the, the historical basket into equal chunks. And then the, 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 the next step is compute the group vector in a, in a sort of time decay weighted average manner. So imagine there is, uh, there is exponential decay and uh, inversely weighted by, by time relative, de, relative to now. So, so this uh, essentially gives more weights to more recent items. And the underlying assumption is that more recent items have more uh, predictive power in terms of the, the user's next step. So, so, so of course the, 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 the weight is uh, between zero and one to, to make this uh, uh, effective. Then with, the, with group vector, we can compute uh, the user vector in a, in a same manner, also by this exponential uh, decay uh, weights. So now we have the user, user vector uh, as representation, then you can actually generate uh, recommendations for specific target user uh, in, a, in, a, in a trivial manner by just combining an, in a linear fashion, the, the, the vector representation of the target user and plus the average of his neighborhood components. And then you can just uh, yeah, sort, it, sort out and then uh, get the top K uh, uh, recommendations from, the, from the, uh, the predictive vector in the end. So as you can see, the, the, whole, the, the, whole, the whole thing lies at the computation of uh, a decaying average of a vector series. So, so we, uh, we, we, without loss of generality, we look at this problem uh, for a series of vector, uh, for, for, for series of real numbers with a time decay weight uh, between zero and one. We uh, refer to this as the DOS value, so decaying, uh, decaying average of series. Uh, it's defining equation three, so exponential decay, but for real numbers here, more, more simplified. And we, we basically look at three distinct scenarios. So the question we want to answer is that, how can we e e efficiently maintain this DOS value in an uh, in incremental scenario, decremental scenario, or in also for in-place updates. So, so I won't go into all the details for these equations, but the, the, the main takeaway here is that uh, we only need to maintain the current value and plus the count. Of course, the hyperparameter, the decaying weight, then we can very efficiently compute and update the, uh, the, decaying, the, the DOS value and in all these uh, three different scenarios. So some of observations for these three different rules. So the incremental and the in-place update rules can be performed uh, within constant time because it only relies on the state. So the current user vector and plus a few hyperparameters and with the additional item. And to perform a deletion, so this is uh, one of the core results of this work actually. So it is, it is actually sufficient to access a slice of the user history instead of the full history. The, you can always, of course, the baseline here is that you can always access the full history to recompute everything from scratch, but that's very costly. So that's the third takeaway to observation is to, we, we actually uh, dec uh, decrease the, the, the number of items being impacted by the deletion from the, the size of the whole history to half of that, um, assuming there is a uniform uh, distribution of deletions. And lastly, uh, there is a dot product in, for, uh, um, Going back one slide, in equation five, there's a dot product between uh, a first order difference of the slice and uh, a, a vector of uh, decaying weights. So we all know that, uh, probably uh, assume that you know that the uh, dot product can actually be computed uh, very efficiently as uh, sort of vectorization. So there are, uh, in summary, there are two key, uh, two key problems we try to answer this work. So for next process recommendation, given a user vector, how in the incremental case, how do you efficiently update the user vector in response to additions? And uh, in, a, in, a, in a reverse scenario, in the decremental case, how do you efficiently also maintain these user vectors in response to deletions 
of uh, user bar skill items. So, so now what, what you're gonna see is that how, how we uh, repeatedly apply the rules that we, I directed earlier in the in, uh, incremental, decremental, and in-place update rules to vector series here, to the TPKN, uh, to the next bar skill setting, then uh, we can actually also achieve the performance that I discussed earlier. So in the incremental case, when we incrementally add new basket, then this will effectively lead to two scenarios. Either it will lead to a new group with a single basket or a new basket appended to the last existing group. So, so as an example, imagine there is a user with four basket and group size is two. So this will divide the user history in two groups. And now you add another basket, the, the user did another shopping session, then a basket five will be appended in a new group. So a, this is a unit group with only one basket and another basket added. And this will, this will uh, update uh, the last existing group. And so with these two scenarios, the, in scenario one, when you're adding a single basket, we just need to apply the incremental update rule in the vector, in the vector form. Then uh, you can already uh, uh, get the updated user vector in a constant time. And in scenario two, you first apply the increment update rule on the group, group vector level, then you will get updated group vector. Then uh, uh, likewise, you can just apply the in-place update rule on the user vector level, then you already have the updated user vector. And so the, the more tricky scenario is the decremental case. How, when, what will happen if you're decrementally removing basket from user history? And this is motivated by GDPR, by the way, because the, the, a user can actually request to delete certain shopping sessions uh, and, uh, in their history logs. Uh, is there right to do so? So for any reason, uh, say we have, to give a concrete example, we have a user with uh, eight basket here, then uh, at a certain time, user tries to delete basket three because there might be some sensitive items in it or for any other reason, then uh, this, will, this will make uh, a modification to group two. So, from uh, containing two basket to containing a single one. And then uh, the user might also want to delete another basket before, then this will uh, cause the, uh, the existing group uh, G2 to vanish. So, th so this covers the two scenarios that could happen when a user requests to delete uh, a, a basket. So we cover, and like we discussed in the incremental case, here in the scenario one, when we're deleting a basket from existing group, uh, in the first step, we just need to update the group vector. And this can be updated if it's just applying the decrement to update rule that we derived earlier. Then in step two, uh, yeah, you can just apply the, the in-place update rule on the user vector level with the updated uh, group vector obtained in step one. Uh, in, scenario, in, in scenario two, when, when you are deleting a single basket group, this one needs to a vanished group vector, then uh, you can just apply the decremental update rule on the user vector level. Then you have the updated uh, user vector. So we also, uh, in this work, we also implemented uh, this system uh, in the data flow system in Spark, in Spark Structure Streaming. This is very commonly used uh, in the industry. So, so in, the, in this picture, basically you see um, the, the core of this, uh, uh, implementation consists of the streaming engine, which has two parts, the incremental algorithm and decremental algorithm. The incremental algorithm covers what we discussed uh, in the incremental case and decremental algorithm the decremental case. So the, when there is a new basket uh, arriving in a streaming fashion, it will invoke the incremental algorithm, which will load the, uh, the, the user vector in the state store, then the output updated user vector, which will be uh, loaded back to the state store. So once that is updated, then you just do a nearest neighbor search to get uh, the top K labors and top K labors will be averaged out to obtain a neighborhood component. And then this will be just uh, nearly combined to produce the final uh, recommendation. And uh, in, the, in, the, in the decremental case, when there is a deletion request coming, then uh, this will also just activate the delete, uh, decremental algorithm, then load uh, the state history because there's also dependency on part of the user history, depending on where the deletion request uh, is located, then you will load part of the user history, then also uh, goes to the same path as we uh, discussed for incremental algorithm. So this effectively enables us to do learning and forgetting simultaneously in one single system. Yeah, so these are, uh, we did some evaluation on the uh, update uh, time efficiency. 
So without going too much into detail on the, on the, on the left, we show that our approach actually achieves uh, constant time efficiency regardless of the number of incremental updates. So, re so it's independent uh, of the length of the user history. Uh, while the baseline is uh, basically to recompute uh, from scratch for every single update. So that is uh, a linear uh, against uh, the number of baskets. And on the right uh, is the, is the update time efficiency of our decrement updates. Uh, what we see here is that uh, our approach is actually constantly faster, constantly, uh, consistently faster than the baseline uh, in, in all three different scenarios. Because as I mentioned earlier, the deletion efficiency depends on the location of the uh, deletion request. And we are looking at three uh, kind of like uh, uh, standard uh, uh, scenarios. So uh, another question uh, you, you might be wondering is also when you start doing increment updates and deletion and uh, decrement updates, uh, how, how does the model still perform? So one, one we find out in three different data sets is that uh, when we do increment updates, it is uh, exactly the same result as the baseline. And that's easy to understand because the there's no approximation over there. The increment update just exactly produce the same computation as the baseline model, only more efficiently because we, we do that at the cost of maintaining the state. And in the decrement update, of course, there will be some sort of a regression because we are removing a part of the user history, but not, not by large. And there are there's some details in our paper how we, how we did the experiment. And uh, I encourage you to read later if you are interested in the more details of the experimental setup. So that brings me already to the conclusion. So in this work, we uh, basically present the, we call the Amelisa recommender system design. So recommender system that can forget uh, efficiently. And uh, we also present an implementation of the next box recommendation, which is capable of real-time learning and forgetting at the same time. And uh, we, we argue that it is important for us to have such systems that can forget quickly in light of the right to be forgotten and also the right to be the right to unrecommend. Uh, so for future work and also thanks to the uh, reviewers. Um, so the, one of the questions we want to answer in the future works is can, can we actually extend this, uh, this framework to more general uh, sequential recommendation models or recommendation system in general to, to, have, to, to learn effectively and also be able to forget effectively. And, uh, and one of the real challenges in industrial recommendation systems because when we look at academic setting, it is easy to assume in a static, in a static environment, but in the real environment, uh, typically there are, there's data lineage issue and uh, there's never a single model that, that is running behind uh, recommendation systems. There are a bunch of them doing feature engineering and uh, doing ranking and uh, doing sorting, all these kind of things. And there's also a very complex system architecture involved normally. So, yeah, so in the end, we just hope for more advances in, uh, in this area to truly realize the future of Amnesia and recommender systems. Yeah, that's all. So thanks for listening. Uh, thank you very much, Benjamin. Uh, nice talk. Um, so uh, as usual, I would like to open uh, the discussion. So if anybody has questions, just please unmute yourselves and go ahead and ask. I have a, a couple of questions myself, but I don't want to be the first <laughs> for a change. Yeah, it's Saturday afternoon. Let's give people more time. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll just ask the question. <laughs> so, um, I was wondering. Uh, so, he, 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 this work is under the uh, is is uh, as. Uh, is as in mind the, the right of it to, 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 to write the, the right to be forgotten and GDPR and all, all that kind of, uh, of yeah. legal uh, yeah. constraints. Uh, what I was wondering is whether this could be useful for other types of um, other types of uh, um, other types of uh, applications like if you know that some data some of your data is outdated for some reason. Mm -hmm. and you want to forget it um, do you have some kind of way of measure of, uh, 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 of measuring the impact measuring the, the 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 difference in predictive ability once you remove some parts of the data um, uh, as opposed to not removing it yeah 
Yeah. So yeah. So if I if I if I get the question correctly, you you're you're asking if we can apply the same framework so also to other other uh, say uh, machine learning tasks and uh, and how how do we quantify the the impact of removing an item in the model as opposed to not removing it at, at all yes that was that was the question yeah so yeah so there are so there are so this is this task we specifically focus on recommendation systems, and there are also other, a lot of other models that uh, uh, actually Sebastian Sierta did a lot of work on that to to look at uh, in a in a generic setting how can we do machine unlearning for all kinds of uh, models, and for some models you can do that effectively. Uh, most of them are sim simpler models. Uh, so and uh, for other complex models, especially those which has uh, sort of uh, iterative training uh, procedure, for example, those powered by SGD, uh, deep learning, for example, uh, they are they are typically very hard to to do a full deletion. Full deletion, uh, in a sense that so when you when you delete an item in a basket and then you compare it to the baseline, the baseline is always to retrain the whole model. Uh, with the whole data set minus the, the item to be deleted. So, so exact deletion will achieve that the, in the same manner. So you, will, you delete a model from a model and the model is exactly the same as if you train from scratch without uh, the deleted item. And for simpler models, you can achieve that. But for complex models and like deep learning, because of uh, the iterative training procedure, there is a very dense dependency um, on the, on the right side are the weights of the, the model and the left side are the data, the, the training data samples. Um, so the, den the, the dense dependency means the each, each, each weight is actually fully dependent on all the training data points. Mm -hmm. So if you want to execute a full deletion, you might as well just retrain the whole model because you need to update all the weights. So, so following this line, and for TVKN and for KN models in general, there is a very sparse dependency. So only, only one part or, or area, or area of the model is dependent on a small region of the data, data space. So you can do that effectively and without resorting to a full retraining. And there are also some other lines of work trying to approximate uh, this impact. So there, there is recent work actually uh, from last year from ICML they are they're, they're trying to do this uh, deletion for deep learning models, but there are still some issues over there is that even though you, you can approximate this by like, like in differential data flow, you can, you can sort of tune this by a threshold of your privacy budget. And there is a very similar budget you can do here to, to say how much, how, how, how much re remaining uh, impact will be into your model. And maybe you can, you can, you can deal with that or you, or you can tolerate uh, that because in a lot of cases you don't need a full deletion so that that you can do but yeah there's still some a lot of ongoing work in there and uh, many in, in in line of scalability and efficiency okay thank you I, we have another question in in the, in the in the chat box by shivam sabu i'm sorry if i'm mispronouncing the name the question is can this method be used to dynamically forget outliers hmm. Can you can you can you maybe elaborate a little bit? So, Shivan, so if you want, to yeah. Continue. So, yeah. can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, what I mean here is, uh, let's say we are training uh, the model on some stream, streaming data, and what would happen is uh, we train a model on some some data points, uh, but over time there could be some concept drift or change of behavior for the users, due to which the the previous data could become an outlier for for the for the new uh, data points or for the current time. So like, can, can this be used to, you know, forget those type of events, which are like not useful for the current time automatically. So something yeah. like that. Yeah, definitely. So uh, I think this can, this can be interpreted also in a generic fashion because this is an, if effectively enables you to forget, uh, any item or any basket, any data point back in history for a certain user. So if you could, uh, uh, outside of the system effectively identify a certain data point as outlier 
then you can just apply this approach to, to delete that certain outlier, right? Yeah. Yeah, okay. thanks a lot, yeah. Thanks for your question. Okay, thank you again, Benjamin, for your nice talk. Um, so I would like to remind everyone that the papers are available on our the website. So if you want to download them, just go there. They're not uh, the final version, but they're, they're pretty close right now. Um, the proceedings, will, the official proceedings will be published later. Um, so we're uh, on for another break, a slightly longer one now. Uh, we will be back at, uh, um, sorry, at uh, 5.20 p.m. So more or less 20 minutes from now. Uh, so plenty of time to go for a walk or to have something to eat or drink or whatever. Okay, uh, see you in a few minutes. Sure. <laughs> okay, you can go now. Okay. Hello, thanks for the introduction. My name is Ladislav Peshka, and uh, my work is uh, done together with Stepan Balzar and Vich Krahak. And the title is Rank Sensitive Proportional Aggregations in Dynamic Recommendation Scenarios. So perhaps uh, I should start with a little bit of motivation on why we actually want uh, to do a proportional uh, aggregation of base recommender system. So uh, what we want to achieve is that uh, given a multiple list of uh, several base recommenders, uh, we want to aggregate them into a single final list of recommendation, which is then uh, given to the user. And while we are doing so, we want to uh, 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 we want to keep the proportions of uh, the relevance of individual uh, base recommenders with some externally supplied uh, importance of each of those recommenders. Well, why we want to do something like this is uh, that we uh, believe that if the base recommenders are selected reasonably, for instance, collaborative and content-based could be a good example, uh, they, uh, uh, in some latent way, uh, represent uh, highly diverse and different uh, views on what the user may want. And if we are able to uh, keep all those different views in, uh, uh, in the final list of recommendations, it, we may uh, hopefully provide more relevant and more diverse recommendations, which could uh, uh, contribute towards long-term sustainability of uh, of the recommender. Uh, I got one more concrete motivation, which goes uh, from a work uh, I was working on basically in 2017. It was uh, uh, about uh, assembling police photo lineups. For those who do not know, it's uh, the image on the bottom right. And it's that uh, if you got a witness who witnessed some crime and the uh, police got a suspect, uh, you want to identify whether the suspect is really the one who was seen by the witness. And to do this in a not very biased way, you want that uh, the witness would select this suspect from a group of other people, uh, which is called fillers. And if you do not want uh, to be in a completely biased scenario where the suspect can be identified just by his basic appearance characteristics, like the top image, then you want uh, to maintain some level of similarity between the suspect and the fillers. That was our scenario. And we come up with two rather simple ways to recommend those fillers to the police technicians uh, to assemble these kind of lineups. One was based on the uh, visual characteristics from some uh, pre-trained deep learning model. The other one was based on the content-based features. And we made some experiments and we saw that, okay, the visual recommendation is better. They lead to about 58% of selections of uh, those candidates versus 37% uh, selections were made by the content-based recommendation strategy. But what we also experienced is that they got very, very small intersection between the candidates, like 2% in uh, top 20 recommendations. And 
And even if we went further uh, in the results set, uh, the visual recommendations were very often completely unable to recommend some of the selections made based on the content-based strategy. So if we use what uh, we would standardly do, just keep the better recommender, then we would strip the user from quite a few really highly relevant recommendations. And the user would not have basically no way how to get them. And especially in this case, that was quite important because you want to uh, have a chance to get uh, reasonable candidates and you need quite a few of them to assemble the lineup. And we were thinking, okay, so how can we aggregate those two uh, algorithms together? But then if you start to think about it, for instance, if you can use some uh, weighted average model or any linear combination, it would uh, outweigh the visual strategy and given uh, because it performed better. And given that there was almost no intersection, then the content-based uh, candidates would not get it to the results. If you use something more fancy like Mutan bandits, uh, they would also oversample after a while the major uh, majority method. And again, you would end up in a situation where you got just recommendations based on a single recommender. So that was our motivation. And uh, uh, we started to think how to do it in a more proportional fashion. And in addition, uh, in this very simple use case, we did not consider any of the properties of the real world dynamic recommender systems like possible preference changes or uh, performance changes of base algorithms, uh, current needs of or context of the user. So, this is the area where we want to uh, put it into action as well. Okay, so what we came up in the end is uh, what we call FASDA framework, which is uh, based on three main parts. One is the proportionality preserving aggregator itself. The other one is uh, what assignment strategy, which supplies the aggregator with the relevancies for individual based recommenders. And the last part is negative implicit feedback incorporation, which deals basically with short-term feedback from the user. I think I'm gonna have time to get into more details just with the first part with the proportion of the preserving aggregator, but I at least sketch the other parts of the framework as well. So for the proportionality preservation, we were thinking, okay, are there some areas where this is also important? And we found that this is basically a very similar task to the one everybody uh, usually once in four years are dealing with as well. And these are public elections. elections. Uh, and for this in quite a few countries, uh, there is a famous uh, uh, Dion's uh, uh, mandate allocation algorithm. Uh, published already in 19th century, which uh, aims, uh, if you got some amount of votes for each political party, it aims to distribute those votes into mandates in some elected body. Uh, the procedure is a greedy one, and each time uh, the Dion's algorithm selects the next best party based on the current votes it got, and out of this party, it just uh, selects the best not yet selected candidate. So it expects that there is a ranked list of candidates per party. And each time this is done, the votes of the party uh, is decreased. Uh, it's divided by K plus one. Uh, and like this, uh, you get uh, a ranked list of selected mandates, which can be considered as a list of uh, uh, as a uh, kind of a fair ordered list of allocated mandates. Well, this is good for, as a starting point, but uh, we found out uh, two problems. One is that in recommender systems, it's quite usual that uh, one candidate 
or one item is proposed by multiple base recommenders. And we should probably account for this as, a, uh, as an additional uh, information or additional evidence of the relevance of this item. And so the second problem is that here we only have a ranked list of candidates, but uh, we are not able to distinguish similarity or diversity how uh, the base recommender uh, evaluates those items. So we need rating instead of ranking. And in order to do so, we need to modify the Dion's algorithm to what we called fuzzy Dion's algorithm. Instead of just selecting the next best party, we uh, intend to select the next best item based on the aggregated relevance of uh, item recommender uh, re uh, item recommender relevance multiplied by the votes the base recommender currently has. So the formula is like this, nothing too complicated. And uh, then we also needed to fuzzify the votes reduction procedure. So if we got uh, one candidate which is selected and this is uh, recommended by recommender one, with 0 0.8 and recommender two with 0 0.2, then their uh, votes should be reduced proportionally. Uh, and this is what we uh, did at Orson 2019. But then we started to think, okay, this kind of works, but do we have some guarantee that this is a fair representation? We were thinking about it for quite a while, but uh, we didn't come up with anything that would be reasonable enough. So we get back to the drawing board and start to think it with a bit wider perspective. And what uh, we want uh, to uh, is to balance two concepts. One is the concept of relevance, where what we usually want is to recommend those items that are overly recommended by uh, the base recommenders. We can, for instance, use a plain sum of the relevancies per base recommender, because those should be the best items. Uh, but on the other hand, we also want the proportionality. So if we, for instance, sum the relevancies of all items per base recommender, it should be proportional to the votes the base recommender achieved. And these are largely orthogonal concepts. And to get our stance here, we started to think, okay, basically what might be a bordering case is uh, what we, I can depict on the figure on the right. Let's consider one possible recommendation where there is object one and two. And if you sum the relevances per recommenders, uh, you see that they are almost uniform. Uh, so they are definitely very well proportional if uh, the votes of the base recommenders should be uniform. On the other hand, you got a chance to recommend objects three and four. They are definitely less proportional. But if you look at it, uh, each base recommender got higher overall relevance. And we uh, set ourselves that this is what we want to achieve. That, uh, this is our stance between relevance and proportionality. So uh, how to do it is that uh, we want to uh, we want to consider the overall relevance of items when we are selecting the next item, but we count it only up to the exactly proportional share of relevances per recommender. It can be visualized by this uh, cap on, um, on the relevance per recommenders. If you think, uh, if you want that each of the base recommenders got an equal share, then recommender two and three are basically the same. Recommender one got an overflow. So we do not count anything which is above 
the share it should get. Uh, given an equation, it may look like that we are getting the item that maximizes the sum per all recommenders, and uh, we sum the minimum between the actual relevance of the item per recommender and the, what we can uh, see as a free space for that pair recommender relevance, what the recommender is missing to be exactly proportional. And if we, uh, if we do this uh, greedily, then at each step, we maximize uh, this exactly proportional relevance sum. So we can say that this, uh, this uh, selection procedure is ranking sensitive. So that, that would be uh, how we can aggregate the base recommenders. But obviously the question would be, uh, what are the votes uh, based on which we want to be proportional and who and how will supply them? Uh, I cannot go into too much detail here, but uh, uh, what we actually utilize in the end were variants of the uh, bounded algorithms like Thomson sampling and uh, linear upper confidence bound, uh, where we basically want that uh, the recommenders that were more successful in the past should get, uh, uh, get higher relevance and therefore should be more represented in, uh, in the final results, but not in the way how the bandits will do it, that they will just sample and in the end, if you got even just a slightly better recommendations for a longer period, they would just sample the majority, uh, the, the most successful recommender. And we were thinking, okay, are we done here? And no. Uh, what we observe when we apply just those things is that, uh, Okay, the vote changes per base recommender uh, systems are there, they are, but they are gradual and rather slow. And if the same applies for base uh, recommenders that are underlined, uh, then what we were very often uh, observe is that two consecutive recommendations for the same user are almost identical. And we were thinking, okay, but that's probably not what we want. Uh, because uh, if the user ignores the recommendation, it can give us some level of signal that uh, he just doesn't want those items. But uh, it's not that simple because you definitely given some e uh, small e-commerce uh, scenarios and also a few other application domains, recommendations are not really on the prominent spot. So it might be that user just did not notice them. So we try to, uh, we try to put this into our models and also put another thing that it's possible that uh, between the time when we showed user the recommendation and now, user might simply change, uh, change his preference and th those items could be relevant at the moment. So we put those uh, kind of uncertainties into our model and aim to reduce uh, the relevance of individual items based on the observed negative feedback with those, uh, with those two uh, features. I cannot go into details, so please check the paper if you are interested. So uh, we evaluated our framework both offline and online. Uh, in the offline evaluation, we focused on a sequential simulation-based evaluation where we used a sliding window of events and we considered the next K items per user as relevant. And we also applied a stochastic noticeability model in a way a bit similar to the one uh, applied by the implicit negative feedback, uh, where uh, we uh, select at random whether the user will or will not notice the item on certain recommended position. And we want that only if 
the item is both relevant and noticed, then we can ca count it as uh, positive feedback as a click through. And one final thing we tried is uh, that in the data, we quite often observed that uh, several consecutive recommendations are done without getting any more positive feedback. I believe that this is uh, really a new thing in our paper that we focus on it. And uh, if you use just a standard uh, non-stochastic recommender, uh, they would end up with uh, two completely identical list of recommendations, but we kind of feel it that this might be well, an opportunity to do a bit better. So we tried to simulate this with a repeat factor that we got several repeated requests for recommendation without moving with this sliding window. Okay, uh, I guess I should hurry up a bit. Uh, we used uh, several base recommenders, mostly the uh, uh, sequential or uh, item to item ones. And we also compared uh, our approach with several baselines, uh, bandits, weighted average, uh, switching the base recommenders, uh, et cetera. Uh, okay, what we found out, there's quite a bunch of numbers, but the interesting ones are the two on the bottom, is that in uh, this scenario, uh, using the fuzzy DA framework, we can achieve uh, really good uh, click-through rates and very good incremental uh, novelty and not that bad uh, the diversity metrics. And uh, if we look at the interplay between the two metrics, what we uh, found quite interesting is that we, uh, mostly by manipulating the level of penalization uh, for the negative feedback, we can quite manipulate the levels of incremental novelty without hurting much the uh, relevance of a click-through rate or even sometimes slightly increase it. Uh, we did not get that much spread of the diversity uh, metrics, but still we are on or close to the Pareto front of diversity versus click through rate. And we also evaluated the fairness of the framework and the exactly proportional fuzzy DA algorithm uh, were much more uh, proportional to the votes uh, of the base recommenders and their share in the, in the final recommendations. We also tried the online evaluation, but uh, it was quite a bit affected by the COVID-19 situation. It was done on travel agency and this area was hit pretty bad. So we got much less traffic than usual, but still we can uh, saw an interesting result that uh, the diversity and both novelty of uh, the proposed uh, framework is quite high. As for the click-through rate, uh, we didn't get fully significant results, but at least we are definitely better than the single recommender system baselines. Okay, well, perhaps a concluding remark would be that uh, I'm quite convinced that using multiple base recommenders and their proportional aggregation makes sense in quite a few scenarios. And one way to do it is to utilize fuzzy DA framework, but still we got quite a few things uh, to work on, uh, mainly on improving the noticeability models and also to get the offline simulator closer to the reality, perhaps uh, by trying to incorporate uh, the context of the current page or so on. So thank you for your attention. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Ladizad. Uh, so anybody would like to ask a question? I had a question. Mm -hmm. um, I was wondering if for like getting the idea for the votes, if you use any of the user features, such that if like one user might prefer a, let's say a popularity recommender, while another might prefer, I don't know, a novelty recommender. Yeah, yeah, thank you. We looked at it and uh, I didn't get into details because of the time, 
but we try to contextualize uh, what the assignments that uh, linear upper confidence bound and we used several contextual features from the user mainly it was uh, with uh, his kind of a seniority like how many items uh, did he already visited or those kind of stuff but uh, if we do not want to use ids themselves it would be possible but in our use cases we got rather very short visits so we would not be really able to train anything soon enough before we lose the user uh, there was not much to start with if you think about you got anonymous sessions perhaps you can track the user between several uh, sessions but you don't really have that much nice data we also utilized like uh, categories uh, he was mostly interested in but it uh, did not make much difference in the end like we didn't get much different uh, selection of the recommenders but uh, the seniority worked up to some extent there were quite a shift between uh, what were the more or less uh, relevant recommenders given the amount of items visited by the user. Awesome, thank you. Very clear answer. Any more questions? So I, I have a quick one. Mm -hmm. I think it's a quick, a quick one. Um, how did you select negative feedback? Was it a random selection? Uh, 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 no, 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 no. That uh, that was based on the simulator. Uh, okay. Yeah, uh, we got uh, all the items that uh, the recommender, the, the final framework recommended to the user, and the ones which were not noticed and relevant, they were considered as negative. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Okay. So thank you again, Ladislav. Uh, thank hope you. To see you soon, sometime. Hopefully. Um, so we move, will be moving on to the to the next talk uh, that will be a, a, um, a presentation of a paper submitted to the workshop. Um, the the speaker is Sahan Bulatwella. Sahan, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Okay, uh, great. Um, so uh, he's coming to 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 present work. Uh, by himself, Maria Perez Ortiz, Eric Novak, I mean Yil Yilmaz, and John Shaw Taylor. Uh, the, the, the paper title is Peak, a large data set of learner engagement with the educational videos. Okay, Sahan, yep. thank you for coming. Um, no worries. Uh, let me share viewers. my screen. <laughs> yeah. Okay, uh, can everyone see the screen and hear me well? Yes. Great. Uh, hi everyone. Uh, today I'm going to uh, present to you PIC, a large data set of learner engagement with educational videos. And as uh, Zhao mentioned, it's the work that I've been, it's an output of uh, the work I've been doing with my colleagues at uh, UCL and Josef Stefan Institute. Uh, so today's talk, I'm going to first elaborate, uh, summarize the contribution that we make, and then uh, go to the related work to this data set then uh, explain the data set creation itself. And we have uh, conducted some baseline evaluations and finally to the results. So what is our contribution? We contribute a new data set called personalized educational engagement linked to knowledge topics, PEAK uh, in short. Uh, the contribution is twofold. First thing, we construct the data set, which consists of more than 20,000 unique learners. Uh, learning in the wild using video lectures. And then uh, there are about 8,000 unique video lectures that are included in this data set itself. Uh, then what we do is we establish a formal prediction task around this data set. And also uh, we benchmark this data set with some base baseline models that we have identified. Uh, so the related work around uh, this work, uh, there are three main aspects uh, where data sets are necessary in the public domain. One thing is uh, recommendation, educational recommendation systems that exploit implicit feedback. Uh, then we want to look at uh, scalable content representation, uh, feature extraction, 
from uh, educational materials and working with fragments of videos rather than full videos. So those are three of the aspects that this data set uh, catches upon. And when it comes to personalized learning systems, there are mainly two schools of thought on how to model a user, uh, especially in an online context. Uh, there's knowledge tracing and item response theory. The problem is that most of the tasks that are around this uh, knowledge tracing and item response theory in the context of education, they are based on explicit feedback. In that sense, uh, what is it? It's learners taking examinations, they are taking tests, and uh, using those tests, they verify their knowledge. Uh, but when we go to the more trending, newly emerging learning technologies, such as uh, massively open online education or open educational resources where there are more lifelong learning or more informal learning settings, this type of continuous testing is very cumbersome and it can diminish the user experience. So the importance of extracting uh, insight or signal from implicit data becomes more and more important. Uh, when it comes to this uh, massively scalable courses and educational resources, we also want to identify how we can handle the content representations. So far, working with you know, very narrow courses in intelligent tutoring systems, this mainly happens through expert annotation. Recently, to automate this, unsupervised learning methods have been proposed, but unsupervised learning methods, you would know, they have complex hyperparameter tuning schemes, and sometimes the outcomes are not that humanly intuitive. Uh, so one of the recent uh, things that we've been experimenting with is entity linking, where we associate content representations or transcriptions or uh, book contents into Wikipedia concepts. So this is kind of in the middle for us because we obtain the automation at the same time. Uh, we are retained with humanly intuitive uh, knowledge components that we can uh, work with. Uh, going from that to video fragments, uh, almost all video recommendations that we work with, they work with full videos recommending an entire video. However, sometimes parts of content is relevant, especially in educational context. When you want to learn a very small content, uh, you know, piece of information, you don't want to watch a 40 minute lecture to do that. Uh, and be, because of that, there has been some recent trends in working on video segmentation, building uh, things like tables of contents from videos automatically. And there's also been uh, strides on intelligent user interfaces where Nonlinear consumption videos is encouraged or intelligent, efficient previewing of videos is enabled. And we have also shown in some of our recent works that uh, we can uh, build predictive models for uh, predicting video fragments and we can achieve uh, you know, satisfactory predictive performance with that. So now that we've looked at the pain points, uh, we come to the peak data set, which is the contribution that we are making. The data source for this data set is videolectures.net, which is a very popular open educational resource repository uh, that contains a lot of uh, videos, uh, as the name suggests. What are these videos? They are scientific and educational videos, mainly uh, recorded at peer-reviewed conferences, which means the correctness of information is uh, controlled in some sense because there is peer review process. Uh, what do we get in this data source? We have metadata about the lectures, venues, etc. We get the transcriptions and also the interaction logs about how users come to this website and consume these video lectures. With this data, we have created this data set and this diagram pretty much shows the overview of how we did that. Uh, so we need two things. Uh, the first thing, we take the video, and from the video, we uh, extract the uh, transcription using translation models from the translectures.eu project. And uh, with these transcriptions, what we do is, instead of using the entire video, we fragment it into a five-minute a five to six minute uh, fragments of video. And uh, why do we do that? Uh, five to six minutes has shown uh, to be an ideal amount of time where a user 
retains attention and also that's about uh, it's also a sufficient amount of time to contain a satisfactory amount of information within a transcript and once we take these fragments we associate wikipedia concepts with it and once we have the wikipedia concepts we rank them and what we have is uh, a representation for the lecture fragment with that and then we take the interaction logs coming from the uh, platform itself and with that we create a label if a user engaged with the materials or otherwise. The final data set uh, has uh, 20,019 users and all these users, they have at least five events associated with them. As you can see from the plot, majority of the users have short sessions, which make this a very opportunistic data set for simulating with low resource environments with very small short sessions. And uh, by looking at the type of concepts that are associated with the lecture transcripts, what we saw is that ma majority of these are associated with machine learning AI related topics. This is aligned with our understanding of videolectures.net where most of the time they visit machine learning data science related conferences and record them. And majority of their audience also come to their website to consume these lectures. And the final data set structure, it's got 16 columns. Uh, the first few columns mainly to do with lecture user identification and the timestamp. And then we have uh, 10 uh, columns where we have a unique ID for a Wikipedia concept. And we have a proxy for the coverage of that topic in the transcript, which is the cosine similarity between the lecture transcript and the Wikipedia page for that concept. And finally, we have the label, which is a binary label, whether the person engaged or otherwise. And how do we calculate the label? Watch time is one of the popular, often used uh, metrics for uh, measuring engagement with videos. And in educational data mining, Normalized engagement rate has been used with MOOC videos to uh, understand engagement of learners. Uh, so what we do is we take the normalized engagement rate for the user with a lecture fragment and we binarize it uh, by uh, hypothesizing that uh, they consume 75% of the video, which is about five-ish, uh, four minutes out of five minutes. Uh, that will allow the user to consume a meaningful amount of information. And uh, now going from the data set to the baseline the models that we calculated uh, from a recent, very recent book on social media uh, user modeling, we identified a few similarity models that associate uh, content to Wikipedia concepts to represent uh, content and from them user representations. And based on that, we calculated three similarity models. Uh, first one, cosine similarity, where we have the bag of concepts and the cosine similarity of those concepts as the uh, numerical value. We can calculate the cosine similarity between two items based on that. Then we have two ways of calculating jacquard similarity. One, we take the concepts, bag of concepts, and we calculate the jacquard similarity between those concepts which is a more discrete way of calculating similarity. Then we also used user-based jacquard similarity, which is kind of similar to the incremental cosine similarity that Olivier brought up in the key, uh, key note earlier, where we take the training data and we calculate the similarity of uh, items based on how users uh, consume these materials. And on top of the similarity material, uh, similarity based approaches, we also uh, use two of the recently proposed Bayesian models that we have proposed uh, uh, recently, uh, where one is an online knowledge tracing model and the other one is called Truler Novel, which is another Bayesian uh, probabilistic graphical model, which is an online learning model that changes its uh, knowledge state of the user based on how they interact with video lectures. So once we have these models, what we did was we benchmarked the peak data set with these models. 
and uh, to also simulate the high resource scenario where the users have a long session we also took the most uh, active 20 users and then we calculated the metrics for them separately and what we can see is that uh, you know longer sessions obviously the performance gets better across the board However, for Jacquard U similarity, which depends on the number of users, because the number of users is small here, the predictive performance is not that great. And what we also see is among the models that we tried, the dynamically changing Bayesian model uh, tend to perform better and significantly well uh, uh, in comparison to the other models. And we also wanted to figure out how many topics we want to incorporate with this data set. And we tried with different number of topics and uh, what we thought, what we decided was we'll go with five topics because what we saw with uh, experimenting with more topics is that the although the cosine similarity and the jacquard similarity increases, the significance of incre increment is diminishes. So there is no significant improvement, improvement and it's not meeting, it doesn't tend to meet the true learn novel model. So we decided we'll uh, you know, cut off at five and keep the data set to five top uh, Wikipedia concepts. The relevance of this data set is in two different uh, aspects. Uh, one thing, we want strong, uh, we want publicly available data sets for implement implicit feedback in educational recommendation and also to simulate environments where we have to use automatic knowledge component annotation um, approaches such as uh, entity linking because if we want to use with a large collection of content we have to resort to automatic methods uh, then we want to understand uh, how uh, people interact with parts of lectures and their relevance how do we model that and this data set becomes relevant to that and because of the scarcity, uh, because of the short uh, majority of short uh, session uh, user uh, sessions, this data set is also relevant to simulating and modeling uh, user data scare scenarios, which also becomes very relevant with things like GDPR that came up in the workshop as well. Uh, and then uh, this data set pretty much has 20,000 users who have their learning journey or video consumption journey over time. So there is potential to model the temporal dynamics of these users and how they navigate through knowledge. And because this data set is associated or linked to Wikipedia concepts, what that allows us to do is to use all the auxiliary data that is around Wikipedia, such as the category tree or Wikidata or uh, a knowledge base like DBpedia. So there are plenty of opportunities there to uh, push the frontiers of this task by associating more information from the universal knowledge representation, which is Wikipedia. In conclusion, uh, a new data set with uh, implicit feedback is uh, publicly available, mainly focused on educational recommendation and a prediction task is established with it. And uh, you can find the data set now in this URL uh, where there is the whole, the data set and some key statistics are also available. And uh, uh, I encourage you and welcome you to, uh, you know, get on board and uh, try to push this uh, task, which would be quite useful and valuable in the coming years, I reckon. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you, Sahan. Um, great contribution. It, uh, we need data, right? Yep. You're welcome. Uh, that's I hope, that's I where hope, I start. Uh, everybody in the community adopts. Uh, everybody that is interested in this, uh, in research on, on especially in, in educational uh, recommender systems, adopts uh, this data set. But I think it's very rich. Um, anybody has questions? Hello. I might have a question. Uh, yes. First, really thanks for the data. We do need them and it's really important. I'd like to stress that. Uh, my question or somewhat perhaps comment in, in the between is, if I understand it correctly, then uh, you uh, use the Wikipedia mapped concepts, which 
still would be kind of a high level information about what the lecture was actually about. Uh, I'm thinking that you probably cannot uh, share the transcripts themselves for privacy reasons, but would it be possible to share some kind of, I don't know, BERT uh, uh, embeddings or something like that? Because like this, the data set would kind of stimulate one direction of possible approaches. This could be kind of complementary. Yes, I, I really welcome that. Uh, yes, obviously uh, there are ethical implications around uh, making the transcripts available, mainly that could backtrack to the authors and we have implicit engagement associated with these lectures and uh, we don't want that. Uh, in terms of, uh, we have been thinking about things like word to vec uh, type of a lecture representation. We've been sort of arguing about it because that also there is a lack of, uh, you know, sort of information lost by doing that because some of these lectures are very long. They speak about various different things versus mm -hmm. some of these lectures are very narrowed. So uh, that is obviously, of course, that's, uh, that's something we would, uh, we would uh, consider very seriously in the future. Yeah, perhaps one more comment, if I may, uh, uh, given uh, uh, that you said that some of the lectures may be more narrow focused and the other ones more wide focused. I'm not sure whether you made some kind of, say, histogram for the amount of topics which might be suitable for different types of work, whether you, I don't know, in a 2.0 version of the data, perhaps think about diversifying it to more reflect the complexity of the individual video chunks. Yes. Uh, well, I mean, the five minute uh, choice sort of uh, addresses that to one degree because we are pretty much limiting the amount of diversity that could mm -hmm. contain in a video. Uh, but we haven't done a formal analysis on uh, like how these topics transition, for example, which is something that we've been thinking about and that would give a better idea about the lecture in general. I see. Thank you. Thanks a lot for the work. Yes, you're welcome. Thanks for the comments. Uh, we have another question in the, in the chat by Benjamin. Uh, the question is uh, just wondering what kind of technique did you use to anonymize the data? Uh, yes, I mean, uh, so what we did in terms of anonymization is we have uh, disassociated the data from the original IDs uh, that are in the original system. And then we have also removed uh, users that have very small number of events, which is like number five events where they are directly identifiable. And at the same time, because the lectures are anonymized, uh, then it's very hard to backtrack into what exact video that these individuals were watching. Yeah, thanks for the, the answer. You're welcome. Okay. Uh, so we have another break, uh, a short one now. Um, thank you, Sahan, once, once again. You're welcome. Um, uh, we'll be back uh, at uh, 6.15, uh, so uh, a little more than five minutes from now, okay? So this one is a short, uh, is a short break, okay? See you in a few minutes. Hello again. Uh, we're back. Uh, thank you for sticking around in a, in a Saturday afternoon. Um, we still have two very interesting uh, talks coming now in this final stretch of the workshop. Uh, the first one is an invited talk uh, by Gokhan Chapan. Hi, Gokhan. Um, and he's coming to present work uh, with uh, a few colleagues of them that I will not say their names because I don't know yeah. how to pronounce them. Yeah, I'm going to say that. <laughs> I trust you to do that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, so the title of the talk is Derek with uh, Lutz, uh, Choice Model for Online Learning from User Interactions. Um, thank you, you, can, you can, thank you. Thank you, Joao. Uh, can you? see my screen and hear yes, me perfectly. clearly yes okay awesome so um thank you for having me first of all 
and um, I'm going to talk about the Bayesian choice model, the Dirich Lewis model for, for learning from user interactions with recommender systems. The model uh, leads to a bandit algorithm for, for online learning to recommend. And throughout the talk, I will uh, first motivate the need for such a model and, and describe its properties. Later, I will describe the algorithm and then uh, I will illustrate why we need the algorithm for eliminating some biases that recommend their systems might be prone to. Finally, I will discuss the performance of the algorithm compared to other algorithms for a similar bandit setup. And uh, this is a joint work with Ilkar, Janar, and Thailand. Thank you. So um, I'm going to start with the feedback loop phenomenon in recommender systems. That is, the recommender systems interact with their users in a feedback loop. That is, the system estimates the user preferences based on their discrete choices from previously pre presented alternatives. And then the users choose from a subset of alternatives presented by the system in line with their estimated preferences. And then the system uh, uh, learns to make new recommendations based on these choices from what was recommended by the system in the first place. So uh, if we ignore the systematic exposure to the alternatives, uh, it would lead to a biased and inconsistent preference estimates and um, such a system unfairly underestimates underrepresented options in recommendations, and it leads to a self-reinforcing feedback loop. And this might even cause the user's interest to go extreme uh, as discussed in previous work. Our solution to that problem is to explicitly incorporate in the inference of user preferences their limited and systematic exposure to the alternatives. We, we do that by, uh, by assuming a restricted multinomial likelihood for the observations. And interpretation of implicit feedback data as discrete choices uh, is an approach that has recently gained traction. And we further interpret here that a click uh, as, a uh, as a choice over only the presented alternatives, the recommendations. This conforms with Luce's choice axiom for individual choice behavior. So, um, so in our formulation, uh, the choice observations are biased because the users tend to choose what is recommended to them. This is also different from the exposure bias that Olivia described in the, in, in the keynote and also the trust bias uh, that is well known to the information retrieval community. In, for example, exposure bias, we say that uh, the absence of click might be uh, due to user being unaware of the item. In our formulation, however, recommendations actually cause positive feedback since um, the user is assumed to choose from uh, uh, what is recommended to them. This is because we interpret a choice observation only relative to the recommended alternatives. And, and a similar bias is the trust bias, where uh, the perceived relevance of an item by the user is higher than it actually is because it is recommended by the system. The, system, the, the user trusts the system. There, however, the increase of probability of click is independent of other items that are recommended, and, and which is different to our assumption that clicks are limited. Also, we have click models, and they also fail to capture um, such interactions because in that case, a click to an item is independent of other items given that the user has a chance to examine the item. In fact, if we ignore the position bias in a click model, the probability of click uh, to a presented item to a recommended item is equal to the actual choice probability to that item. Okay, I'm 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 gonna I'm gonna illustrate this phenomenon in a figure. So uh, here we assume we have four items denoted by by, by the balls, 
and their sizes are proportional to their actual choice probabilities. The system recommends two of them based on, based on its estimate of choice probabilities. And the user either clicks one of the recommended items, items or does not click at all. In figure B, we see uh, the items where click probabilities are adjusted with trust bias. So the actual click probabilities are, uh, are increased uh, by a little bit. In figure C, we see that items where click probabilities are under the cascading click model and uh, the probability of click to the first item is the same as its choice pro probability, but for the second item, we have an adjustment due to, uh, due to its position. And in figure D, we see the items where click probabilities um, comply with Lucy's choice axiom. Since the choice is relative in that case, the click probabilities are proportional to their actual choice probabilities, but since they are restricted, the click is restricted to a recommendation, the probability of click is amplified. And, and also we have a, a, some probability for opting not to, uh, not to choose, not to click. So the, the, the person simply skips that session in, in our framework, this can be treated, this can be, uh, this can be implemented used, uh, by assuming an additional dummy option, which represents opting not to choose. <laughs> and uh, one might ask um, how, how, how we can come up with, with this assumption. And in fact, our assumption <clears throat> can be attributed to the principle of least effort, which states that uh, humans with least effort pick from, pick from their choices unless they are too unsatisfactory. The print, this principle indicates that the user would choose the, in the most convenient way. That is, they simply choose from what is recommended. And hence, such user behavior may justify our assumption. Formally, here we assume an interactive system where there's a total of K options and a choice that is KT is made from a recommended subset of all alternatives, all items, which is CT. And the choices are made with probability proportional to a vector of preferences, the choice probabilities, which we denote with theta. And uh, if we ignore what is presented to the user, the likelihood is the multinomial likelihood as in the first equation where YK, YK is the number of times an option K was chosen. However, if we say that a choice is re restricted to the recommended alternatives, the likelihood becomes as in, as in the second equation where we have an additional statistic mu where mu C denotes, uh, denotes the number of times the set C was recommended. So these quantities are related, by the way. They are row and column sums of a contingency table that, uh, that indicates uh, which item was chosen when a particular subset is recommended. OK. Of course, we are interested in inferring theta, that is the vector of choice probabilities for, for all items. The prior distribution we show here, this one, uh, is parameterized by alpha and beta, which we call as pseudo counts of choices and recommendations. In the posterior, we simply increment corresponding alpha and beta with statistics y and mu, and the, the posterior form is here. This distribution, appears to be discovered by Dickey in, in, in 1983. And its normalizing constant is written in terms of a special hypergeometric function uh, called the R function by, by Carlson. And this distribution uh, is a generalization of Dirichlet distribution because it reduces to Dirichlet distribution if all choices are made from the whole set of alternatives, which which, which doesn't happen as we know. 
I want to discuss some properties of the model and a fundamental advantage of it. The, 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 the key property, the fundamental advantage of the Dirichlet loose model is the independence of unexplored options. That is the preference estimates for the options that were never presented are invariant, independent of other choices made. So uh, on the contrary, if we ignore what was recommended to the user, the items that were never shown has an un unfair disadvantage and they cannot get exposure in the future. This figure uh, illustrates, illustrates that. Here we see the contours of the posterior theta uh, where we have only three options where the choices are restricted to items one and two. If we ignore the fact that uh, the choices are made from one of one and two, item three is pe penalized. If we do not, the posterior probability of preference to item three stays invariant, as we see in this in this figure. Indeed, this property ex applies to call start items and also newly introduced items to the system. However, um, since there might be multiple realizations that lead to same Y and mu, the statistics, the posterior ignores the associations between the choices and particular rep recommendations. Uh, here, I wanna illustrate that with the evolution of the posterior in, 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 in two different scenarios. In the first one, there is cyclic, um, the, there's a set of observations for, for cyclic preferences. So the user prefers A to B, then B to C, and, and then C to A. And in the second one, we have a tie. Uh, um, the user does not prefer uh, any, any item in any, uh, in, in, a, in any pairwise setting. But they end up with the same representation of the posterior. So this is an undesirable behavior, but perhaps we can model that cyclical choice behavior as a mixture of preferences, as hence with a mixture of digitally loose densities, which allows us to model complex choice behavior. Such a model is also plausible because there's evidence in psychology literature on user behavior being due to a mixture of transitive preferences. Um, having said that, another concern might be the dimensionality of the statistic. The, the, that statistic uh, goes over all subsets of the set of items and hence the size of a dense mu is combinatorial. However, the posterior is actually log concave in log theta due to properties of loose model. And we can get a good, good preference estimate with a low effective dimensionality of mu. Here uh, in the example, I illustrate that we can actually recover a good representation of theta uh, by using only uh, k, uh, k K distinct pairs uh, by, by, by exploring only K distinct pairs uh, they, and they are selected such that they satisfy the conditions for log concavity. So this says that we can still estimate the true latent theta by exploring only K subsets. In fact, in that example, it is K, min it is K minus one to be precise. So uh, the dimensionality of mu is not a concern because Seemingly combinatorial, this problem is actually not. <clears throat> okay, so we have that conjugate density for uh, with, with nice properties. And I will now discuss the bended algorithm that is derived from the dirichlet loose model. And it's gonna be a Thompson sampling algorithm. So uh, first, let's me, let me explain Thompson sampling in, in regular k arm bended setup where each arm is associated with an unknown mean reward. And we, we maintain a posterior distribution over these mean rewards. And at each round, we sample mean rewards from these posteriors and pull the arm associated with the highest sample. In our case, the arms are not independent. 
And our action is not an arm, but a subset of arms. So the application of Thompson sampling in that case becomes to sample from the joint posterior distribution of preferences theta, and then picking the top L options, L being smaller than K accordingly. So um, since the Dirichlet loose is conjugate, we can, we can implement, we can devise a particle filter and which is, which, which is actually the sampling subroutine we used here. here. Um, one might ask what, uh, whether the bended algorithm is needed at all. In fact, um, Thompson sampling plays an essential role in estimating preferences of the users. And I'm gonna illustrate that with two examples. The first one is called the second chance. Here, uh, when an inferior item, which is option five here, uh, is preferred to a relatively favorable item, which is option two, and this can happen by chance. And then the afterwards in, in future recommendations, the, the option five is naturally going to be ignored by the user because it's inferior. Um, but, but as it is included in the, in the future recommendations, option two is going to be penalized. And this is due to transitivity. And the algorithm finds that the option five is inferior in the future rounds, but option two is even more, um, even more penalized. The algorithm would think that option two is even more inferior. In order uh, to avoid from such a situation, we need to explore. Hence, we need, uh, um, we, we need an algorithm that explores and uh, mended algorithms are for that. And the, the second example is a similar one, which is robustness to unfair comparisons. Here, when we, when we have repeated comparisons, repeated recommendation, recommendations of the top two options, the system might develop a misconception that the option two is actually overall inferior. Again, by allowing uh, sufficient comparisons of the options thanks to the exploration due to the bandit algorithm, the system will correct the preference estimate for that item. I will um, now compare two approaches of modeling choice of observations. One ignoring what is recommended to the user. This is the HTML autonomial and the other explicitly conditions on the previous recommendations which is our case, usually those. Here we consider two cases where in the first one, one item, option three, is included in every recommendation. It is promoted. The Ishla multinomial overestimates preference to, to it simply because it is overrepresented. For, and, and the Ishla Lewis does not, and for the sec in, in the second case, we have, uh, we have for the initial 100 rounds, we hide the first three options, the, the most favorable ones. We then run Thompson sampling for both models. And because the initial loose does not impose initially negative bias towards the censored items, it would eventually, and it does eventually discover and recommend them. So finally, I would like to mention a few performance experiments. And um, there are related bended setups uh, to our problem, uh, which are in the case of pair preferences, the dueling bandits problem, and in the case of larger uh, presentation sizes, the combinatorial bandits with relative feedback problems. We compare the algorithm for, uh, with, with several dueling bandit algorithms and one combinatorial bandits with relative feedback algorithm. The user feedback is simulated according to the loose choice model. And the comparison is made in terms of dueling regret, which is positive if we do not have the most favorable option, uh, item in the recommendation. It's weak regret. The algorithms 
uh, on the legends here are sorted by their performance. And Lishli Luz performs substantially better. And the closest competitor is double Thompson sampling developed for dueling bandit setup, which maintains pairwise preference statistics and runs a variant of Thompson sampling. Um, finally, uh, we made another set of comparisons with a state of the art online learning to rank algorithm with click models. This algorithm again maintains a pairwise order relation and produce rankings based on a based on a, a topological sort of items, hence the name top rank. We evaluate the algorithm in terms of the cumulative regret at the first position, the second position, and so on. And for that, we used artist listening data from NASTFM, and we first fit a latent digital allocation model on this data set on click data on um, listening data and got a bunch of preference vectors uh, indicating a, a, a vector of transitive preferences. And we used one of them as the underlying choice model and then simulated user choice to the recommendations according to the underlying choice probabilities. And um, finally, um, I would like to conclude the talk with a summary. We believe that digital loose has a potential of being reused in implicit feedback recommender systems. And it also is a very effective bandit algorithm that achieves low regret in certain bandit scenarios. But of course, uh, I described here a single user transitive preferences case for the model to be useful, it should be extended to a multi-user setting. I would like to thank you very much and thank you for having me. Thank you, Gokan. Um, nice talk. So anybody would like to ask a question? Uh, hello. Go ahead. Hey, it's like I keep asking questions, but- No worries. <laughs> uh, I really like uh, the talk, but there's one thing I'm wondering. If you got uh, just a pure recommendation scenario, then I guess I understand it, but would your model be extendable if you got kind of a mixed scenario where the user usually gets recommendation, but he, for instance, can also search? And how would those, let's say, directly exposed items go into your scenario? So are, are you saying if... Um... If the user is exposed to such items, not by the recommended systems, but by other means. Yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah, this, I mean, this works regardless, but this is not useful when the, system, when the users are randomly, uh, randomly exposed to items. In that case, we don't have this bias, but if we systematically recommend things to them, then we, we have the bias of uh, the recommender system writing its own future, actually. Yeah, yeah. I was thinking in a way that uh, if you get, for instance, a standard Netflix, almost all the interactions are recommendations. But sometimes right. uh, people intentionally search for it. it. It was that law, if the choice is too unconvenient, you do something else. Would those occasional feedbacks of other type be incorporable? Yeah, I, I mean, and the, there, there are two steps for that. First, we need to also incorporate uh, um, the fact that the user uh, opts, opts not to choose, right? Uh -huh. And uh -huh. we, can, we, can, we can model that by assuming a dummy option, which, which extends the dimension of theta by one. Uh -huh, uh -huh. And it's going to have its probability. So it's going to be the general tendency to, uh, to opting not to choose. Uh -huh. And it's going to be, it's going to be taken by the user, depending on the quality of the items they see on the screen. Yeah. So, you, the, yeah, yeah. so the, I guess I so got this, it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. This model allows, uh, to, uh, 
uh, to also model the fact that the, the user can, can opt out. Ah, thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay, I guess not. So, Gokhan, thank you again for having accepted you. Uh, the invitation to come. Thank you very um, much. Uh, our next uh, and final talk uh, will be done by Tun de Pessinier. Good luck, Tun. It is, um, it is a, a, a contributed paper to the workshop. Uh, it is on, available on our website. So uh, the title is Batch versus, uh, versus Sequential Active Learning for Recommender Systems. Tun, welcome. Thank you. Okay, for thank you. Um, I was a few minutes ago. I was disconnected from Zoom, so I'm not a host anymore. So I I cannot share. Okay, I'll make screen. you a host. No, no worries. Let me just find you here. Um, okay, you should be able to to do everything now. Okay. You should now see my my screen. It's coming up. Not yet. Yes. Now. Okay. It's, okay. Go ahead. Okay. So um, my name is Tonde Pesmeer. I work at Ghent University in Belgium, and I will talk about the usage of active learning algorithms for recommender systems. Um, so. Um, Machine learning often have problems with a shortage of labeled data. And also recommender systems have to cope with a limited amount of, of ratings. Um, active learning is typically used for cases in which limited data is available. Um, it is a technique that determines which samples provide most information, or in other words, which samples can increase the accuracy the most. Um, and this here in this slide is an example to give you a better understanding why active learning works. Uh, so in the plot on the left, you can see all the samples with their true labels. Uh, these are the green squares or the red uh, rectangles. Um, so this is a classification task. Um, but the problem is for many applications, we only have a limited number of label samples. So you can assume that you do not know the labels of many data points. And trying to, uh, to get the labels of all the data points uh, would be very expensive. Um, or in case of, of recommender system, users don't rate everything. So as a result, you would want to sample a small subset of points and use these labeled data points as your training data for a classifier. So in the plot in the middle, you see um, a classification that is performed by first randomly sampling a small subset of points and then labeling them. However, you see that the decision boundary created using this classifier is suboptimal. This is the, the blue line. Um, the blue line is clearly skewed away from the red data points into the green shapes area. Uh, so this means that there will be many green data points that will be labeled incorrectly as red. Uh, so this skew is due to the poor selection of data points for labeling. In the plot on the right, on the other hand, uh, an uh, classifier is used, but this time we selected a small subset of points using active learning. And now uh, the decision boundary is significantly better as it separates both colors better. Uh, so this improvement comes from selecting data points so with an active learning algorithm so that the classifier was able to create a very good decision boundary. Um, so um, active learning. Um, active learning is, is a uh, technique that is also used in machine learning. So in traditional machine learning tasks, uh, they involve a, a gathering of large amounts of data randomly sampled from the underlying distribution. And this large data set is then used for training a model that can perform some, some kind of, of prediction. So this is called passive learning. Um, collective, collecting label data is often expensive and time consuming. Therefore, uh, there is only a limited uh, amount of data available that is, that is labeled by uh, a user that is uh, rated in a case of a recommender system. 
so the main hypothesis in active learning is that if a learning algorithm can choose the data it wants to learn from, that it can perform better than traditional methods with substantially less data for training. Okay. Um, active learning for recommenders. Um, so uh, the active learning algorithms can be used to cope with the cold start problem. Instead of asking users to create an initial profile with preferences for categories, for example, active learning can be used. So the active learning technique can select some items and ask the user to rate these items. And active learning will typically select the items from which it can learn a lot for the user profile. Uh, an additional challenge, however, is that, that users should be able to rate the item, uh, typically without consuming the item. And we call this the rateability of an item. The rateability is often depending on the domain. So that's uh, an additional challenge. Okay. Um, how does the active learning algorithm select the items that the user has to rate? Well, a large pool of unlabeled data points or items are available typically. Uh, and we estimate for each item how informative a rating would be. Uh, next, the most informative items are selected. Uh, in machine learning, uh, the strategy for selecting items is often based on how confident a machine learning algorithm is in labeling the items. However, in, in recommender systems, these confidence or information values are different for every user. Uh, moreover, in many recommender systems, the probabilities for observing um, the different labels, one star rating, two star ratings, and so on, are not available. Um, so you don't have often, often you don't have a confidence value or these confidence values should be calculated next to the prediction values. Right. Just move to the next one. Yeah. Okay. Um, so active learning for personalized and uh, for recommender systems can be personalized or unpersonalized. So uh, active learning scenarios require some sort of, of measure of the information value um, of the ratings. Um, so in the context of recommender systems, uh, some strategies provide the same results for all users. We call this the unpersonalized active learning strategies. And these typically use the ratings of the community and the characteristics of a rating distribution um, to estimate which items uh, are asked for the user to give a rating. Examples are selecting the most popular items, the items with the highest rating variance, or items with the highest rating entropy. In personalized active learning strategies, the most informative items are selected for each individual user. These strategies take into account the available ratings uh, of the target user. Uh, for example, for a content-based recommender, it would be good to obtain a rating of items covering different genres. Um, these uh, personalized strategies are often the most advanced ones, and uh, the focus of our research is on these personalized strategies. So in this slide, uh, I will um, tell you about the uh, strategies that we used in our experiments. Um, so the active learning strategies and uh, the first two strategies are highest prediction and lowest prediction strategy. These are the simplest uh, personalization strategies. They run a traditional predictor algorithm on the data set and subsequently ask the user to rate the items with the highest or lowest prediction score. For the, highest, for the highest prediction strategy, the idea is that items with a high prediction score have a high probability to be familiar to the user, so they can receive a rating. And in case the item with the high prediction score receives a low rating from the user, this rating is a good correction of the user preferences. The lowest prediction active learner is a variation on the highest prediction active learner, as indicated by the name. This learner asks the user to rate the items with the lowest prediction score. So the probability that the user can rate the item might be lower since the user dislikes the item according to the predictor. But uh, for example, in the movie domain, uh, it's likely that the user has not yet seen a movie if it doesn't fit into his sphere of interests. 
and as a result, the user might not, might not be able to rate this movie. The advantage of this active learner of the lowest prediction strategy is that the recommender gets some negative feedback. In general, users are more likely to rate the items that they like, so a lot of ratings are, are very positive. Since users typically choose for items they, they think they will like, um, almost all the ratings in a data set are positive. So this is a problem that is also um, often referred to as a self-selection bias. Uh, so we can um, partially solve this with the lowest prediction active learner strategy that asks the users to rate the items that probably will have a um, low rating. Um, the next strategy is um, binary prediction. Binary prediction active learner is uh, an external is using an external predictor to rank the item. How does it work? Well, um, the goal is to identify items that have a high probability that the user can rate them. Uh, so asking users to rate unknown items is not meaningful since users will typically skip the rating process or provide unreliable ratings. Um, so a recommender algorithm can act as a predictor of the user's item selections. Um, so binary prediction first transforms the rating matrix into a binary matrix with the same number of rows and columns by mapping the null entries, these are the missing ratings, to zero, and the not null entries, uh, these are the available ratings, to one. So this binary matrix specifies which items have been rated by which users. Next. A recommendation algorithm is applied to this binary matrix, resulting in a prediction score for each item. And this prediction score is used to rank the items. Items with a high prediction score have a high probability to be consumed by the user. The idea of the binary prediction active learner is that items with a higher score also have a higher probability that the user is familiar with these items. And as a result, uh, the, the user can provide a rating. We say that these items have a high rateability. Um, the next uh, active learning strategy that we have uh, used in our experiment was impact analysis. Impact analysis is an active learner that searches for items that enable the recommender to make a prediction for other items that could not have been predicted before. Um, think about an, uh, an, a simple user-user collaborative filtering algorithm that cannot generate um, predictions for an item if there is no similar user who has rated it. Um, so impact analysis can identify user item pairs for which the rating reveals additional user similarities. These user similarities can then be used to calculate rating predictions for other items. Here in the figure, you see an example. Um, it shows the user item pairs for which ratings are available. Uh, you see this on the left. And then uh, a collaborative filtering algorithm needs four nodal paths. Uh, so with uh, a path with four hops. Um, in impact analysis, searches for edges that create the most additional four nodal paths. Uh, so suppose that the active learner wants to gain additional information about user one so that a collaborative filter can make a more informed decision. So which item is the best to ask the user to rate? Well, as indicated on the right side of the figure, the most informative rating is uh, item four. So a rating of user one for item four creates um, two new four node parts. So you have one node part, one part that goes from user one to item four to user three to item three. And you have an additional part that goes from user one to item four to user four and, and then uh, to item five. And um, if user one is able to rate item four, the collaborative filter is able to make a prediction about item three and item five. Um, then the last active learning strategy that we have experimented with is uh, decision trees. Uh, so in decision trees, um, you can uh, decide which item of the data set to ask the user to rate. So each node of the decision tree evaluates user preferences towards a certain item and directs the user along a labeled edge to one of its subtrees based on the user's ratings. There are three options. Um, the user likes the item by scoring it higher than the average rating value in the data set. The user dislikes the item by scoring it lower than the average rating value of the data set. Or the user does not know the item and is unable to rate it. 
based on the user's ratings, the user follows a path from the root, from the root to the leaf um, that characterizes the user. Thus, after each split, the set of users is split into three partitions, one for each option. And subsequently, the algorithm continues with the partitioning of the remaining users in the next node. Um, so here you have an uh, example in the slide that shows the, the tree. Um, so what was the goal of our research? Well, the goal of our research is to compare batch mode and sequential mode. Uh, so it's important to make a good selection of items that are offered to the user. Uh, so, and this is the task of the active learner. And all those items can be selected at once. So this is called the batch mode or the selection can be made item by item. And this is what we call the sequential mode. Uh, so in sequential mode, the selection of items, the selection of the first item is based on the available ratings, the ratings that are available before the active learning process starts. The selection of the second item is based on these ratings as well as the first rating that is obtained by the active learning process. So, and this continues in the same way for subsequent item selections. Um, so if we have to make a selection for item number N, the active learner has N minus one additional ratings to make a decision. Uh, here are the results. Um, these are the results um, based on uh, the Jester data set. Uh, the graph shows the performance uh, of a um, recommender algorithm in combination with an active learner. So here, um, the recommender algorithm was used of user collaborative filtering, and we have used five uh, active learning algorithms. Uh, so binary prediction, uh, the decision tree, highest prediction, impact analysis, and lowest prediction. So you can see the active learning algorithms on the left of the slide. Um, the JASTER data set is a rather dense data set. Um, so as a result, the NDCG that we report here in the slide is rather high. And the goal of this study was to investigate the difference between these uh, batch mode and sequential mode. Um, so we also studied the impact on the accuracy of, of the final recommenders. Um, so what can we see here? Well, we see that um, the active learner in sequential mode typically has a higher NDCG than the active learner in batch mode. Um, so this is an, uh, a good example here um, where sequential mode is, is better um, uh, because a higher NDCG means uh, better recommendation algorithms. So the box plots show uh, the minimum, the first quantile, the median, uh, the third quantile and the maximum value for all users in the data sets. Um, we also provide more graphs in the paper. Uh, this was only with user user collaborative filtering, but we see similar results for item item collaborative filtering and uh, Funk SVD. Um, here you see the, the same results, but with a different data set. Here we use the book crossing data set. The book crossing data set is a sparse data set. Um, and here we see, in fact, no significant difference between batch and sequential mode. The reason is, according to us, the, the sparsity of the data set. So it's much more difficult to learn with a few additional uh, ratings to learn more uh, about the user. Um, so um, it takes more time to learn um, an, uh, a, good, a good profile. So conclusions, um, we have experimented with two modes for active learning, the batch mode that selects all items at once and the sequential mode that selects items one by one and calculates in between these selections, which items would be the most informative one. Um, for a dense data set, the results show that an active learner in sequential mode enables a recommender to learn more efficiently than an active learner in batch mode. Um, personalized active learning strategies select different items to rate for different users. Typically, these have a higher accuracy um, than with unpersonalized active learning algorithms. Moreover, the personalized active learning algorithms also have a higher probability that the user can rate these items. Therefore, these algorithms are less suitable for new users, but uh, these are better for users that have already a few ratings in their profile. Um, personalized strategies often use an underlying recommender algorithm and are therefore more complex. 
So for each user, uh, a training of the underlying recommender is typically needed. As a result, it does might take more time to calculate which items are the most informative ones. So the active learning algorithm also has an uh, additional computational cost. Um, thank you for your attention. And if you have questions, I'll try to give an answer. Thank you, Tun. Um, so anybody would like to ask a question? I or more than one, one question? I have one. Ah, go ahead. Okay. So, uh, soon you, you mentioned that too in the talk. So, it's, it is known that in recommender systems that we have selection bias, right? So, people selectively rate things yeah. that would rate higher. And an active learning algorithm would ask a rating on the items that the user wouldn't rate, uh, wouldn't evaluate. Does that harm the user experience? Um, indeed, that's that's a very good question. Um, so um, active learning is, is uh, a technique that can be used as an alternative, for example, for an initial profile creation. Um, so you will ask users to rate a few movies before the recommender can, can start making good recommendations. Um, so if, if this process is too intrusive, if the users have to do a lot of effort uh, for, for rating these, these movies, indeed it can harm the user experience. Um, so it's, it's a little bit a trade-off between asking more information and, and uh, having better recommendations and asking less information and uh, having a more fluent user experience. Thank you. Anyone else? I, I have one question. Uh, I was wondering, well, it, it basically your, your, your active learning strategy is to select items. Uh, would, it be, would it be feasible to also select users? I mean, uh, some users may give, may, may, some, some user profiles may be more informative than others to, the mod, to, the, to a global model, right? So I was wondering, have you thought about that? Do you have any comment about that? Um, I have not yet thought about that, but I think it's a good suggestion. Um, so, um, indeed, it, it can be, you, you have some users that are more informative in a uh, recommender system than other users. Um, these are yeah, influencers or, or whatever uh, we call this. And indeed, these users that have more influence, um, can, can, we can ask them to rate a, a few additional movies uh, in order to boost the profiles of, of, of other users as well and, and to boost recommendations of other users as well. A user that has a lot of similarities with other users might be a perfect example um, to ask a few additional ratings to give. And, and this way we can um, stimulate the recommender to have better recommendations for for all the users that are similar to this target user, I think. It's, it's I think, a very good suggestion to uh, not only look at, at the item, uh, but also look at the user uh, in an active learning algorithm. Okay, thanks. Um, anyone else would like to ask a question? So if not, Tun, thank you very much again. Uh, thank you all for uh, sticking with us uh, in, a, in a Saturday afternoon. Um, I mean, afternoon, depending on where you are in the world. But, uh, um, but anyway, thank you. Um, and this is it. Um, I think it's been a very interesting uh, uh, workshop. Um, I hope to meet uh, at least some of you in person in the next few months, uh, if not in Seattle next year. Um, okay, so thank you very much and have a rest, uh, have a nice day or night or uh, <laughs> whatever. Okay, bye-bye. Bye. Bye and thanks. Bye.
Bye. Bye, guys. Oh, man.